Good afternoon. Welcome. I am Amber Miller, Dean of USC Dornsife. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our third LA symposium, Pump to Plug. I'd like to start by thanking our partners, the LA Clean Tech Incubator and the City of Los Angeles, as well as our generous sponsors, Audi and Electrify America. Also, we wouldn't be here today without LA's Chief Design Officer, Professor Christopher Hawthorne, who created this terrific Third LA initiative and who is also a professor here at USC Dornsife. This initiative is focused on the city's dynamic reinvention while learning from its storied past. A couple of years ago, we challenged our USC Dornsife scholars to identify research areas that would put us on the cutting edge. One of the themes that they came up with was anticipating the impact of innovation. And it's fun to see this in action here today at this event. Many of us in California are already driving electric cars and are convinced by the environmental benefit of a widespread transition to sustainable energy sources. But far fewer of us spend a lot of time thinking about the infrastructure required to support such a change. Where will we charge all of these vehicles and how will that affect public spaces? Where will thousands of EVs um, on the road mean for our electric grid? And what will happen to the more than 10,000 gas stations here in California alone? At USC Dornsife, our scholars are exploring the science and technology required, as well as a wide range of societal impacts. Our Academy in the Public Square initiative celebrates robust collaboration between Dornsife's experts and community leaders. And our newly launched public exchange hub is building the connective tissue that's gonna make this easy and effective. For example, we have economists working with the LA Clean Tech Incubator to study both policy and industry-led solutions to stimulate growth in vehicle electrification. Our USC Dornsife Union Bank LA Barometer Survey is mapping out the LA mobility and sustainability landscape. And we have chemistry faculty working with batteries um, that have transportation applications, just to name a few. Today, we're gonna to hear ideas from architects, designers, and planning experts who are exploring the wide range of issues that will need to be addressed in our transition to electric vehicles. If we collectively get this right, what we do here in LA will serve as a model for the rest of the nation and the world. I can't wait to see the ideas our design teams are bringing this afternoon. So I, without further ado, I will turn it over to our leader. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Christopher Hawthorne. Thank you so much, Dean Miller. Really appreciate your support of this event and the third LA series more, more broadly. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening or good morning to those of you joining from other time zones. It's really remarkable to see the number of participants climb and we were We've really been pleasantly surprised at the uh, at the response to the, um, the the call for folks to join us today, given the the really specialized nature of um, of these questions that we'll be exploring. But I think what we've realized in working with the architects and working with the respondents who will be part of the discussions this afternoon is that these really aren't specialized questions. These are questions that will affect uh, communities across Los Angeles in a profound way over the next generation. Um, and really, what we do here has been so as so often has been the case uh, when it comes to the architecture of mobility will be really studied and copied for better and for worse across the United States and across the world. So it's really my pleasure to welcome all of you to Pump to Plug. This is an event that I uh, have been working on and thinking about actually since the earliest days of my uh, time in the mayor's office, uh, Matt Peterson, who runs the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, one of our partners. Um, uh, he and I sat down probably more than two years ago now to talk uh, through some of these ideas, and we're all really thrilled uh, that those conversations long gestating are really coming uh, to fruition this afternoon. So let me offer some thanks. In addition to thanking uh, uh, Dean Miller again, let me thank uh, the partners at USC Dornsife and the Academy and the Public Square that have really made this event possible, particularly Kate Weber and Mariana Baboni, Corey Clark. Jim Key and Michelle Boston, who have helped us put the event together. Let me thank our partners and sponsors. Lacey, I mentioned Matt Peterson already, the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Um, they have had quite the week uh, with their Transportation Electrification uh, Partnership Summit uh, just wrapping up over having taken place over the last couple of days. And I want to welcome anyone joining us who has been taking part in those events. And finally, special thanks to Audi and Electrify America. Uh, a special thanks uh, and really our gratitude to all of the participating firms who will be making presentations this afternoon 
and to our respondents uh, who come really from a wide, a wide range of expertise and, and experience, both in city government. We'll have colleagues of mine from the mayor's office, uh, colleagues from the Department of City Planning, but also experts in, uh, in real estate development, community development, mobility, electrification, and energy, who will help us uh, put the presentations from the participating firms into some context. So let me briefly give you a sense of, um, of the run of show this afternoon. Um, it's an unusual uh, set of sessions across the entire afternoon. So we really encourage you to stay with us, to, uh, to dip in and out, to, to plug in and out, as Mariana has put it, over the course of the afternoon. We will begin in this first session uh, with presentations from three firms looking at the architecture and urbanism of the charging station of the future for electric vehicles, looking at a particular site in downtown Los Angeles. Um, we will do that until about 2.30, 2.35 or so. Then we'll have a break and we will reconvene at 2.45 with a very special presentation of photographs of gas stations that we commissioned from the Los Angeles photographer, Jonna Ireland. Um, elegies of a sort for a building type that of course all Angelinos are deeply familiar with, but which is beginning to fade from the scene, at least in its traditional form as we accelerate the transition to electric vehicles. We will then hear presentations from two more firms um, looking at the future of LA's gas station sites. We have more than 550 gas stations just within the city limits of Los Angeles alone. And uh, we ask these firms to help us think creatively about how we should um, consider these urban sites in the aggregate. Of course, they're privately owned. There are all kinds of complexities that attend any strategy for the future of gas station sites. But it's our feeling that we need to begin to have some comprehensive discussions about how we can manage that, tr that uh, transition most effectively in a way that really um, takes into consideration the future of those sites, whether it's housing or open space, and really puts environmental justice at the center of that series of questions. Um, that will go until 4.15 or so. We'll have a second break and we'll see more Jonna Ireland uh, photographs. In this case, uh, after having seen the black and white images, we'll see some color photographs by Jonna. Uh, and then we will come back at 4.30 for the final session on the design of charging depots for uh, electric trucking fleet, looking at sites um, near the port of Los Angeles. Um, and we will hear a presentation uh, from, from one firm, Moss Architects, uh, looking at those questions. So the overarching theme is really thinking about this transition to electric vehicles. We now have a mandate, um, having been set down by Governor Newsom, um, that we will not be uh, we will not be selling internal combustion engine vehicles past 2035. Um, and we may see parity between electric and, and internal combustion engine vehicles much, much sooner than that, uh, as soon as a couple of years from now, according to uh, some projections, certainly over the course of the next decade, we will see that. And that raises all kinds of questions. Uh, one, what, what do the facilities look like that we will be using to charge electric vehicles of all kinds, and that will be, as I mentioned, the focus of this first session. Um, and then what happens to those gas station sites, how um, you know, some of them, as we'll hear, have played important roles in, in communities um, beyond uh, their role as fueling stations. So thinking about what this transition to electrification means for those sites. And finally, the electric trucking fleet is the, uh, the question that we'll be taking up in the final session. Gas stations have really been emblematic of Los Angeles um, for more than a century, uh, and they've come in a variety, as we all know, of architectural types. They've been cloaked in Spanish col colonial revival red tile dress. They've been cloaked in much more modern kinds of architectural costume, if you will. Uh, but they have stayed pretty fixed as an architectural type in terms of their proportion, their scale. Uh, their locations largely at, uh, uh, on corner sites. Charging stations, by contrast, are much more, much more malleable, um, and they can take a, a, a greater variety of forms, and they may really change as, as charging times come down uh, over time, uh, as it takes less time to charge a, a passenger vehicle, for example. The role that they play in the urban context will, will, need, to, will need to shift accordingly. Uh, and that's the question that we're gonna take up now in our first session. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that we'll be hearing presentations from three firms in the following order. First, SAW, Spiegel Ihara Workshop. Then we'll be hearing a presentation from Abelos and Sinkowitz Architects. 
And finally, a third presentation from Woods Baggett. I want to thank all of the firms for the work they've done on a relatively tight timeline in putting these presentations uh, together. We really asked the firms, as you'll see, they dug very deeply into uh, the questions at hand, but we also said they should feel free to make these provocations really challenging the city, um, my office, my colleagues in the mayor's office and the Department of City Planning, other departments of the city, challenging us to think uh, creatively about how we should approach um, this set of questions. And then after we hear those presentations of about 15 minutes each, we will uh, have a discussion that I will facilitate with a number of uh, respondents who, as I mentioned, have real expertise in this area. And I will uh, introduce those respondents when we reconvene uh, for the discussion section of this first category. So having said all that, let me thank all of uh, you in the audience again for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and let me introduce Dan Spiegel, who will make the first presentation again from the firm SAW Spiegel Ihara Workshop. Dan. Thank you, Christopher, USC and the city of Los Angeles for having us here. We're delighted to be a part of this conversation. The manifesto from US Architects Declare states that the interlinked crises of climate breakdown, biodiversity loss, and societal inequity are the most serious issues of our time. Meanwhile, an overwhelming consensus of experts identify beneficial electrification as the future path to urban sustainability. Car manufacturers have begun to produce increasingly efficient, increasingly desirable electric vehicles at an accelerating pace. We will need more and fast as California will ban the sale of gasoline powered cars by 2035. Urgency is its own sort of design problem, requiring flexibility, dexterity, informality, and hopefully some fun. We are reminded every day that human behavior around car ownership and charging is in flux. Implicit in this brief is the assumption that charging stations are a form of planned obsolescence. We will need many more in order to encourage the proliferation of electric vehicles, at which point charging will be so ubiquitous, perhaps even autonomous, that stations will no longer be necessary at all. Building types go dormant from time to time due to cultural technological shifts, but it does still seem unusual to pursue a new ephemeral type. In this case, the success of this new type will be measured in part by how quickly it disappears. Impermanence is a tool. Parklets, for instance, allow for radical rezoning of high stakes urban corridors because they can theoretically be removed quickly and easily should the need arise. Permitting processes are streamlined, implementation is quick and flexibility is baked in. Since the need for electric vehicles is urgent and the type is fleeting, impermanence is the opportunity. Drawing from traditions of scaffolding, set design, and event space, the future of EV charging stations is flexible, modular, temporary, reconfigurable, and redeployable. Sociologist John Urry observed in his prescient 2004 paper, The System of Automobility, that among the characteristics of automobility is that it subordinates all other modalities, extending so far as to reorder people's understanding of time and space. This includes, of course, refill stations, though in a slightly different way. While charging times are likely to shorten significantly in the future, it is clear that charging right now is much slower than fueling. This means at least two things. One, charging cars takes about six times more space per hour than fueling them. As such, it is essential to maximize charging spaces. We propose 40 rather than 12. Imagine pulling up to a charging station at capacity and waiting hours to park and fill up. And two, if charging takes a long time, well, you might need something to do, and we've got you covered. Cars are, of course, much more than just means of transportation. Since at least the 1940s, the major auto manufacturers, such as Ford in this 1949 ad shown here, promoted their vehicles as extensions of the domestic space, or as domestic spaces themselves. So when your car is charging, you're being displaced from some part of your home as well. The charging station it would follow should become a place to reside, at least temporarily. The same holds for commercial and cultural activities. While the ubiquity of cars may have generated fissures in the urban or in the fabric of multi-use neighborhoods, they've paradoxically become vessels of cultural activity and identity. The drive-in movie came and went and came back again. The drive through diner turns the driver's seat into a restaurant. Tailgates turn into scaleless block parties. And now, of course, the 
car as a medical clinic, a presidential victory rally. It seems that proximity to a car in stasis can be an enabling agent, facilitating all sorts of activities. With at least 30 minutes on our hands while charging, we will leverage this latent energy into variable social condensers. Gas stations are driven by standards, none of which is more apparent to the passerby than the prevalence of canopy. It provides light, shade, and protection from the rain and snow. It even establishes identity. But less frequently considered is the capacity for this structure to do all of these things while establishing a new territory, an elevated ground. Cars and pedestrians observe different tendencies of locomotion and especially with a certain density over a certain duration, there are real advantages to sorting these things out, to elevating the ground for pedestrian and habitation. Our proposal, Play, consists of a kit of parts. This idea, of course, has a rich history in Los Angeles, most notably Jurdy and Sussman's 1984 Olympics. But the task here is a little different. We propose a kit rooted in infrastructural utility drawing from the dimensions of vehicles, the logics of multi-deployability, the elevation of the ground, and the necessity of full inhabitation over, under, around, within. The basic module is simple, not so dissimilar from a scaffold. Helical piles replace conventional foundations, allowing for a light touch on the ground. Hollow tube frames support platforms and distribute wiring and tracks for electrical pathways. Once the basics are in place, a full catalog of programmatic accelerators are available to customize or transform each deployment, all fitting within the same typical module. Stairs, swings, slides, benches, bathrooms, screens, planters, tables, shade canopies, Wi-Fi hotspots, phone charging stations, and more. First go in the helical piles, but right on the heels of their deployment, the subsequent layers of the frame can be installed. There are certain types of movement that cars handle well and others not so well. High density lateral maneuvering falls into the latter category. Since charging capacity is of the utmost importance, Play deploys three parking robots from Hikvision to sort the cars along five rows of charging stations, moving the cars from entry to exit, from empty to charge. Customers will pay for the amount of time that their vehicle spends in the station, charging or otherwise, providing app-based input to the sorting algorithm. Here you can follow a single car across a 30 minute charge. The driver is probably upstairs. One space per row is left open for sorting while maintaining a high density of charging and a linear flow of traffic while reducing pre-charge wait times. Transformers, bathrooms, and attendance booth also occupy the ground floor along with truck charging on the right and scooter charging on the left. Unlike gasoline, electricity can readily power a number of different critical objects safely and cleanly, from the ubiquitous laptop to the essential smartphone to the overhead lamp, and of course, to the vehicle. With a source and a plug, entire vessels of program can be turned on, allowing for a different urban diagram. Rather than requiring that programmatic activity emanate from the stable building structure, we can up rotate use types so long as there is a reliable plug. The private lot on Main Street will house the clearest examples of this, a choreography of mobile commercial types to animate the hardscape in the most transient way, plugging in to provide a variety of indoor and outdoor uses, such as the mobile barber truck in the mobile lingerie store we've deployed previously, providing flexible urban commercial exteriors and interiors. In the primary charging station infrastructure, vertical rods extend from the light post structure underneath, carrying the charging infrastructure upwards, to power gathering spaces above, suspend lighting, lighted canopies overhead for shade and illumination, and supporting the demands of temporary events such as screenings and performances. At the most basic level, each deployment consists of a street edge to provide shade and small vehicle charging, an elevated public ground, public amenities such as bathrooms, a maximal number of automated charging spots, and separate areas for truck charging. The base case scenario is configured specifically for the site at 7 
49 South Los Angeles Street. The street edge is defined by a light deployment of bench seating, shade structures, trees, and other plantings and modular planters, charging stations for e-bikes and scooters, and of course, signage. And a special mention for this slide, after all, this is supposed to be fun. The general public can make their way over to the stair and on up to the elevated ground, perhaps stopping at the restroom module along the way. Drivers pull into the loading aisle and then park on a small platform in one of the 10 spaces in row one. They plug their car in, program a duration or capacity, hop out and head upstairs. Again, rather than 12 charging spaces, there are 40. Delivery and other medium-sized trucks enter from Main Street, parking in one of eight spaces under a separate dedicated canopy, which doubles as an entertainment infrastructure and a solar PV collector. For special events or low traffic days for deliveries, the back lot will host these electric urbanism events. The elevated platform is a park in this case, operating alternately as a plug-in or play space, seating areas selected from the catalog form a variety of arrangements from workstations to play objects to benches along planter boxes. Dichroic canopy modulars, modules cast shade and animate surfaces. Intermittent voids frame the procession of charging vehicles as a didactic entertainment. The terrace becomes a verdant landscape open to above and below, easily marking social distance for as long as that's necessary. Recharging vehicle and driver alike. Change is inevitable in electric charging systems, and in fact, it's necessary. This of course pertains to technological systems, but also maybe even more so, it pertains to cultural systems. Charging is the baseline, but what are the other opportunities that charging requires or affords? We understand that this lot will eventually be developed in a more permanent way. But if we wait for that to happen, we may miss the opportunity entirely. Remember, this moment is fleeting. The first phase is immediate. A manageable half plaza deploys over 40 charging stations with room to grow. A solar powered pavilion charges delivery trucks towards the back scooters, signage, and street plantings towards the front. It's 2022 and it's going well. The elevated plaza is entertaining chargers and providing mod, uh, popular recreational spaces for the neighborhood. The plaza is extended across the remaining spaces. Now it's the summer of 2023 and eager for a basketball fix, downtown LA reconfigures the plaza kit to host an exhibition tournament while still retaining full charging capacity and a long plaza to gather. The time passes quickly. By 2024, of course, the pandemic has passed, yet tastes and habits have been transformed. The weather's good and outdoor film screenings have become increasingly popular. Outdoor dining has proven persistent as well. And why not, given the climate? Now with shade across two levels, diners can enjoy a variety of food options with only a slight reduction in charging capacity. The 2028 Olympics loom large, promising a dispersed network of events, including a two screen multi-terrace viewing party while charging. It is clear that EV charging is urgent, fleeting and necessary. And as such, we propose a large scale infusion of charging capacity before it's too late. But we recognize that our vehicles are still, in many ways, just extensions of humans, of human desires, of cultural systems. To that end, it is important not to take lightly the value of land for the activities of people. We see the next phase of EV as an event, a large-scale, emphatic coalescence of environmental need and enthusiastic human response. In this context, EV charging stations will become popular, ubiquitous, and eventually obsolete. As broader adoption of electric vehicles takes place, so too does the dispersal of the charging grid. The play kit peels away slowly, gradually returning land for long-term use. This nursery configuration brings along trees and plantings in situ. 
which eventually are embedded in the ground. Leaving a new ecology, perhaps a new ecosystem behind. This of course would work on a variety of different sites, but we'll have to tell you about that another time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. A uh, really fantastic start. And I wanna, um, it really points us in the direction of, uh, of a lot of, of really strong potential areas of discussion. Um, I wanna welcome any members of the audience who have joined us during that presentation. We're looking at the future of charging station design, their architecture and urbanism in particular. And we've asked all the teams uh, in this category to look at a site at 749 South Los Angeles that is owned by the city of Los Angeles um, uh, between 7th and 8th and connecting between Los Angeles and Maine. And uh, we've asked them to think about uh, charging infrastructure across the day uh, in the immediate term and then also across the decade, as Dan mentioned, as, um, as charging time, times and technology shifts. We've asked them to think about all of those questions. So that's uh, the site that we have in mind for this category. So thanks again, Dan. It's now my pleasure to introduce the second uh, firm that will be presenting, Jose de Andres and Iñaki Abalos, uh, joining us from Spain. Um, take it away. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting AS class to be part of this exciting event. Here is Iñaki Abalos. Hi, here. Who is director and founder of the company, and me, Jose Andres. Well, our proposal is called Evolutive Prototype System, or EPS, which means, like any innovation, going far beyond a cosmetic or genetic transformation of what is already known. Go next, please. Next, please. Okay, thank you. I just want to mention that this research project has been developed in two stages. Uh, a present day say, situation, answering where are we now question, and then uh, a question about we're going to be in the next decades, in 20 or 30 years. We strongly believe that in terms of architecture, we need to invent a, a new typology for charging stations capable of responding to a new functional, economic, and technological context. The context that emerged suddenly in the recent years, the world of digital and collaborative economy, the horizon of the electric and autonomous car, the clean energy, and so on, just to mention a few. Can we go to the next slide, please? Next, please. Okay. In this sense, we have prepared this table, which compares present day gas station characteristic with uh, the future charging station potential. I would like just to list some, like the organic and adaptable geometry, the sustainable materials and passive energy capture, the open to nature, the healthy and friendly environment. To summarize, we could like to sit from a driving model, which has been designed for the car, to a staying in model made for city, for a better city and, uh, and for the citizens also. If we go to the next slide, please. Looking into the future and changing the paradigms of what a gas station is and should look like means also transferring these principles to special solutions. Next. Our proposal uh, not only proposed a solution uh, tailored for a, a specific site, but also proposed a system, an open system conceived to grow and change in, in time. Next, please. This is what we call evolutive prototype system. You can see on the screen the three case studies that we have called A, B, and C based on the scale and functional configurations um, that more or less uh, are related to the most common cases we can found in, in LA. Um, these, these cases uh, um, can, can be implemented now, but are also uh, conceived for allowing transformation. You can see on the screen, the uh, hope could grow in 2027 and then in a future 
complete uh, a scenario in 2032 when, when autonomous car and other uh, systems that are now starting to arise it could be implemented. If we go to the next slide, you can see some examples of this growth map. Go, go ahead, please. I would like to flick through this. Typology A is the smaller cases. If we go to the next, the typology B is a medium size that goes from a linear functional scheme to a more radial one. Go ahead, please. You can see how we have uh, two, three cases. Typology B is the medium size, is uh, related to a site and uh, really close to the one we are working at. And in the next slide, we have a. Next, please. We have the last one. Which, which is thing for the corner sites that are the, the biggest one and, and have a, a bigger impact. Go ahead, please. Let's go to the model slide. Mm -hmm. Once more, one more, please. Yeah. <laughs> and this is more or less our final step a radial configuration around a core with different services and interior space uh, which is the central essence of this new prototype let's go to the next slide this is a physical model of the system we are proposing it's based on a honeycomb hexagonal mass of 225 meters of site which as can be seen in the next slide can grow in different manners in order to fulfill the, the future demands. If we go ahead, please, you can see how the size guarantees easy prefabrication and assemblage, as well as a pleasant human scale. Um, mm. Go ahead, please. One more. Here, okay. Finally, you can see how all the arrangement uh, guarantees the uh, same identity and iconography of the system, regardless of any specific layout or uh, location. But now let's go ahead and focus on the specific location on 749 South Los Angeles Street. It's the site that you already know very well, probably better than us, but we would like to show you what we want to propose. If we go to the next slide, you can see our initial sketch where we, uh, you can see that we are proposing uh, the entrance and exit on the opposite streets and a central core, a central pavilion that is associated with the northeast edge and creates uh, a really important central space that is fulfilled with uh, the main station. If you go to the next slide, you can see how the future charging station uh, have a, a really permeable transition be between interior and exter exterior and, and is um, around a central interior garden with a water wall. You can see how uh, it's attached to the uh, Los Angeles street where it creates such an entrance where uh, electric bikes and other sorts of um, public or, or mixed public and uh, private transportation could create a sort of intermodal space. If you go inside, you, you, can, you will discover some services like a uh, small coffee or a classic store, but also services like car rental or car sharing. If we go to the next slide, you can see that we are proposing a core radial solution, much more compact than, than, than other stations or, of the tradition. It makes a better use of the site, which deals between the shuttle casting and the solar energy production, enabling a more balanced, balanced functionality in all directions and a better control of the vehicles by the users 
which are going to in, uh, going to be enjoying uh, coffee or resting in a really interesting garden. This, what you are seeing, is an initial stage, uh, a stage that could uh, uh, be the transition from the gas stations to electric uh, pan uh, scenario. But if we move forward to uh, stage two, let's say five years ahead in the next slide, you can see how this hexagon creates an interior courtyard, an enclosed garden, which is uh, a community space. Uh, think for, um, for the neighborhood to provide services to the neighborhood, but also to, to provide services that uh, are related to new um, technology and demands. If we go forward to the phase three uh, in 10 years, you can see that this final stage of the prototype evolution organized around it an ecosystem of services and could act um, in fact as an authentic intermodal node for a new system of transportation in the post-carbon era. Okay, let's go to the next stage. You will see how this solution Please go ahead. All right, <laughs> thank you. This solution also provides urban continuity from the street, um, creating a small setback space that acts, as I mentioned before, like an interchange space. You can lift your bike and take a, a car share, a car sharing, or you can um, wait until your bike is full load to to take a ride on the city or maybe you can wait uh, for a taxi here. So uh, these stations are no longer spaces uh, for uh, just a quick drive in and dri drive out, but also are places to stay, to enjoy um, a good quality time with your friends or, or maybe just to, to, um, to, to, to change your, your private uh, vehicles to a um, more sustainable way to enjoy the city. If we move forward to the next slide, you can see an interior garden, a meeting space protected from the street noise where you can wait and enjoy a oasis of climatic comfort full of color and vegetation. In order to full much more this side of color, we pretend to create uh, a street art on the wall side. And also, we, we think that the gas station sh should, be, uh, should be part of community culture and, 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 and not only uh, be dominated by company iconography. So if we move forward to the next slide, we will discover the back side of the plot. Yes, <laughs> you are seeing now the charging totems of the delivery services, which are separated from private ones. And, and we are proposing here the use of innovative material, such as um, uh, high porosity asphalt, in order to, on one side, on one hand, to reduce the head bubble effect on the city, uh, science, since its reflection coefficient are much smaller than the usual uh, asphalt, but also at the same time maintaining and respect the natural runoff of the terrain, which I think that is uh, a really uh, important issue in Los Angeles. If we go ahead, please, you will see the lighting system we are proposing fully powered by renewable sources, such as photovoltaic glass that you can see on top of each canopy. This glass will allow this space to be properly illuminated in, during the night, uh, but also guarantee the, the iconic character of these stations and the safety, of course, of the users. If we go ahead, we just want to, mm -hmm. to show you a small animation. Yes, we're going uh, 
I, we, we just want to, to show you these certification icons to, to say that the, the features and materials that are proposed in, in this project guarantee an easy attainment of the highest lead, green, or well certification standard. But we are also concerned about cradle to cradle. If we go to the next slide, this image shows the spirit of cradle to cradle two cycles, the natural and technological cycle connected by architecture, return waste to its origin, conceive waste as a proper material for construction in order to close these two cycles and connect them. If we go to the next slide, you can see a glimpse of the materials we are thinking about. Wood, which is the biospheric material by excellence, that uh, is not only natural, but it's a tank of CO2, uh, around uh, half kilo per kilo of wood around, and, and, but also recycled materials such as this aluminum foam uh, in panels that will uh, be part of the enclosing materials, enclosing uh, panels. And finally, a photovoltaic glass, a productive material that, uh, that creates energy, not only for charging the vehicles, of course, but also to, um, to, to this lighting system I mentioned before. And you can see this is a, a, um, a hexagonal photovoltaic glass by the firm, the company Onyx. If we go to the next step, yeah, mm -hmm. you, <laughs> you can see another animation that, of course, it doesn't work, but don't worry. It's, uh, it's the proof that this permeable concrete really works. It's a really high-tech material, um, or low-tech material. In fact, it's really simple, but it's really necessary in, in our cities to protect uh, underground uh, waters. Okay, let's move on. Here, you can see our first constructive approach to this proposal. You can see that it's a really um, basic uh, scheme with a really great economy of means with um, a single pillar uh, that contains this from six to uh, 10 hexagons made by um, uh, a wooden plate of 50 centimeter thick wood uh, cut by CNC method, um, and this on the left side are the in, enclosed panels that could be easily removed and and, and, and play, replaced again in order to allow grow the grow of the pavilion. And if we go to the next slide, please. I would like to show you just a glimpse of how the appearance and materiality of these prototypes could look like. You can see that there's a lot of people walking inside. There's vegetation, there's color, there's a, a play of, of sun and shadow. If we move forward, you can see that the, the vehicles are no longer the, the center and the focus of these uh, stations. Uh, and another uses, but the center is made for um, a place to stay, a place to enjoy the city, uh, enjoy um, uh, a, a good um, climate inside the, this courtyard. Um, let's go ahead to conclude. This is how a um, charging station of the future could look like. Um, we believe that the success of any future model lies therefore in its capacity to change for progressive change and adaptation. There is a great opportunity or even a responsibility to extrapolate these principles and ideas to architecture and to, and to and build prototypes. This, is, this has been our contribution and I hope that this evolutive prototype project we are presenting could be a contribution to this future scenario. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much to you too. Really, really appreciate uh, that collection of ideas. And without any delay, let's move into the third and final presentation in this category from uh, Woods Baggett. It's Matthew Sharm and Nick Corrales. Welcome.
I'll just get started. So, okay, so no, that's all right. I'm here. I'm here, Matt. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you, Christopher. We've been infatuated about the um, future of mobility in LA for a very long time. It started with our research work in LA Commotion, and our infatuation is fundamental not about the architecture, but it's about the culture of speed. Um, the speed has been um, the rich source of the rationale between how these forms of gas stations have emerged, how you see space through speed. Today, uh, we're going to present some, um, some uh, work on the, based on some demographic study of what is endemic of the culture of speed in LA. It's addiction um, to petrol. We want to now shift that addiction from gas to addiction to electricity. But once, If we are able to do that, then we'll be able to get everybody to actually enjoy the experience of, of, of a recharge LA. I'm going to hand over to Matt to discuss how indeed we've looked at the various components of that addiction and how it can, can transform some of these um, um, pump stations to enriched places. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. So our proposal for Recharge LA uses electrified mobility really as an opportunity to reinvigorate and, and re-energize, as Nick is saying, to really look at the potential for inspiration and create a cultural currency for the future of Los Angeles. There's three provocations that we look at. How can these charging stations be representative of their local communities? How do we promote the incredible forms of expression and cultural identity uh, through an, a kind of new form of automobile? And how do we create an adaptable and embedded infrastructure that has different lives throughout the day and over time? Next slide. Okay, next slide. Um, th thank you. So th this proposal draws from a considerable momentum. LA has become the epicenter of mo uh, a mobility revolution, really. Making, unmaking, remaking ways we live and move. The changes can be felt everywhere in streets, sidewalks, parking lots, and gas stations above your head and below your feet. There's a real desire for innovation here and pushing the boundaries to try new things. Next slide. And this pump to plug initiative really exists within a constellation of innovation that's being pioneered in Los Angeles and, and truly encouraged by the city leadership. From electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, micro mobility, delivery bots, digital twins, the, uh, the parking to places as Nick had mentioned before, and now pump to plug here. Next slide, please. So for our proposal here, Recharge LA, what we're trying to do is actually plug into culture. How do we look at, at uh, community gathering within Los Angeles, food trucks, cars and coffees, donut derelicts, uh, the, the iconic car culture of the city, JDM, lowriders, custom cars, and actually neighborhood and borough identities as well, from East LA to Koreatown to what our proposal will be in, in downtown that we'll show you in a moment. Next slide. But truly, and, and I think that this starts to speak to, to Nick's ideas that he was presenting, what is the cultural currency of, of, of EV? Can this technology participate in an expression of local culture? Can it become as iconic and representative as a, a 58 Impala or an 86 Corolla? We love this idea of tough, cheap to buy, easy to modify, the innovation that comes from something like that. Next slide, please. And what is the, the new iconography for a filling station? Can we go back to the aspirations and, uh, of, of a kind of democratization of use? bringing average buildings of everyday life, gas stations, shops, food, car washes, and in this case, pump stations, a spirit to, a, to, a, to, to kind of embody a spirit of our new modern age. Next slide, please. So Recharge LA really envisioned 749 South Los Angeles Street twofold by pumping up sustainable mobility innovations and plugging into the culture of Los Angeles. Next slide, please. And really thinking about what is, what is the Los Angeles version of the town square where different communities come together. And in fact, we see this as kind of the flat surfaces throughout the city, in many cases, parking lots, and, and as we'll see in a moment, the site that we're going to look at. Next slide, please. And really, how do we create uh, a place at the speed of culture? How, how do we draw from this idea that you, LA has an in, incredibly unique architecture and, and really this architecture needs to be seen from the car or your rear view mirror. It's an architecture as a kind of three dimensional sign. Next slide. In a landscape of promotion and branding, it's about getting people's attention. Next slide. It's about creating a cultural moment as it was done here in 1967, a kind of rock and roll, art gallery that was started by the doors. Next slide, please. 
And then actually, how do you kind of reappropriate that through culture? How do the communities take over these billboards of advertisement and actually use it as a form of representation for themselves? I must say that this is my, friend, my son's favorite slide from the presentation. He asked me this morning uh, why Mickey and Minnie were dancing with that woman. Next slide, please. And really starting to think about a, a plug and play or kind of infrastructure module. And so we, we looked at this in, in two different ways, a kind of canopy surface that has a multitude of different uses. And, and we described this as a, as a as sort of hackable billboard. It's not just about shading, potential for solar panels. Can it be performative? And actually can it serve as a screen to kind of promote culture? And then the ground surface itself, a kind of layered infrastructure. Could it be permeable pavers? Can, as the technology comes online, it become an inductive charger? A kind of digital underlay where you have information in the ground plane as you're moving throughout. And then actually a green space. Next slide, please. So we actually look at, at the idea of a kind of soundstage, or it's almost a provocation or an inspiration, a blank canvas to really kind of create art and culture. And so what we're looking at to do here in our proposal is, is create an almost kind of scaffolding. A scaffolding that allows for an adjustable location for a signage, a, a kind of immersive environment that, that's, that's created through a digital display, as we'll see in a moment. Next slide, please. And so if we start to think about the modules in the ground plane themselves and, and thinking about how they start to be grouped together and actually how that, that changes through time, what we, what we looked at was actually that these modules could be interchangeable and, and change throughout time. So in 2022, when you're going to a discrete moment on the site to charge your car, for instance, as the technology changes, as the desire for, for different uses changes throughout the site, can this be something that's changed and plugged and played? And so we'd start to look at what happens in 2032. And in particular, if you have a kind of embedded infrastructure in your ground plane. So no longer is it about kind of discrete points, but it's much more opportunity because you're going to different places throughout the site and becomes much more fluid your engagement. Next slide, please. So the first moment we look at is, is EV charging in 2022. And as we looked at this portion of the site, we focused on the, on the southern portion along Los Angeles Street. And we have the 20 charging stations here, and you can see this. You, this is the first kind of glimpse of, of the scaffolding of the canopy as we were describing it. And we'll show you uh, some more imagery in a moment. But in this condition, it's serving its kind of base functionality where it's a kind of uh, shading element for, for the cars as you're parking there. We've, we've particularly chosen this portion of the site to start with because we actually think that there's a, a great opportunity to build from the energy of the adjacent lot where you have a, a market space. So if we go to the next slide, please. What we look at here is actually a kind of daily transformation. And so in the 2022 case, what we're looking at is that transformation occurring within the canopy uh, structure itself. Actually, the, 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 the piece that's used, um, as we could see in the previous iteration, um, as a kind of screening. So in the morning, when you're arriving onto the site, it's kind of charging and coffee. But then at lunchtime, the canopy itself moves along, along the scaffolding that we've provided. So when there's shade on the eastern portion of the building, it actually becomes a billboard on the side of the building. You can see here food trucks in that, in that condition, and you can see the seating along the shaded area. But then at nighttime, does it become a drive-in theater? So is there an opportunity that we actually use this sort of infrastructure as a kind of billboard and a, and a different use case at night? And then importantly on the weekends, can we actually think about this as a kind of cultural moment a kind of reinforcement of, of the car meet, a kind of incredible billboard for, for you, you viewing cars, these, these tricked out cars as we had looked at previously. Next slide, please. What starts to become exciting is that we, as we progress to 2028, is that you actually take more and more of the site. So the modules push to the northern portion of the site, and then you start to have a real kind of through site link. And for us, what we liked about this is that it allows the opportunity for a multitude of kind of simultaneous use. So in this case, where you're charging on the southern portion of the site, you move towards the north and you can start to think of this more as a park. And so these activities could be occurring simultaneously. So it's not just throughout time, but it's also a kind of layering that's occurring throughout the day. Next slide, please. But then potential of, of the 2032 evolution, where your entire ground plane is actually an inductive charging and it becomes much less about kind of discrete points. So a kind of maximized open strategy all the way to an urban park where you can actually move flu fluidly throughout the site. It's not a direct link. You're actually kind of meandering through that path. Next slide, please. And so in, in the, the first instance, we look at it here, it's kind of a food truck alley. And we think that there's an opportunity here actually that the food 
trucks are, are plugging into this infrastructure as well. You're using the energy of the site for, for multiple things. It's not just about uh, the energy for the car, but it's about the different ways in which you, you're using the site, even if you're sitting at a table and you're kind of charging your phone on the table. But this is really what this kind of technology speaks to. It's kind of embedded. Um, it's, it's almost an afterthought because it's a part of the, the urban spaces that we're, uh, that, that we're existing in. So in this case, you have a food truck alley, you have the market on the western portion of the site, you have food trucks towards the east, and then a, more of a park towards the north. Next slide, please. And then, in, in, and then at nighttime, does this become a drive-in theater? So, you know, similar to, to what we had shown in the 2022 condition, you actually have a screen, but this is actually reinforced by food trucks to the north. So there's a, it's not just about the, the singular use, it's about a multitude of different, different lives that are lived on this site, so that we're really activating it in a number of ways. Next slide, please. And then, you know, excitingly for us, does it become about an event? Do we take these incredible car meets that are occurring where people are showing off their car and really showing off their culture, and do we actually use this as a, as a kind of way to further promote that and further represent that? So there's an overlay of digital media here. So when you're, you're showing off your car, it's actually further reinforced by the screen itself. But then there's also an overlay of this media kind of globally as well, as you can start to think how this can be projected out beyond the site itself, but over the internet as well. And here we start to look at actually, you have the kind of central moment, but then you have a moment that's occurring off to the side. So multiple events that are going on at once, and you can also start to see the kind of culture around food with the food trucks towards the, the, towards the north. Next slide, please. And then the urban park. Imagine if you don't actually have to go to a discrete point and your canopy becomes a tree canopy itself. And so you're not, not necessarily having to, to kind of be regulated by a, a formalized grid, but it's, it's much more fluid, your relationship to kind of a natural environment, trees in the, in the center of the city, much more of a park. Next slide, please. So really we're trying to create a sense of place and plug into culture. As, as, we, as we think about some of the key ideas that we were drawing on from, from before. We want to create community gathering. We want to look to iconic car culture. We want to, we want to draw from the surrounding neighborhood. In this case, we show off a, a number of kind of simultaneous activities. So you can see here the charts, the cars charging underneath the canopy and it's providing shade. Whereas in the foreground, you can start to see the, 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 the food trucks. Next slide, please. And as we transition tonight, these uses change. So it becomes an event, an opportunity to show off your car. Perhaps everyone is gathering to watch a movie, as you can see here on the left. Or there's an adjustable billboard that becomes the ultimate reinforcement of showing off your car. Next slide. Clearly, we had some fun putting some cars in these images. I hope you can see that. How do we imbue the ground with the, the qualities of the most successful public spaces? A multi-use, pride of space, in service to people, and evolving during the day. In this perspective, we see the community gathering around food trucks. The billboard sh provides a shade uh, for the seating area adjacent to the buildings. And you can, can see the, the cars in the foreground and an opportunity to show, the, uh, to, to show them off. Next slide, please. You know, interestingly enough, the, the original McDonald's was meant to be a kind of place of social gathering via food. It wasn't just a place to pass through. And what we see is this is an opportunity to kind of reinvigorate or, or, or re-energize towards that. And a lot of that has to do with, with providing opportunities in the middle of the city to actually to then stay on the site and, and have a kind of social gathering around eating. And so in this case, the, the sign becomes a canopy adjacent to the market of the building to the west. Next slide, please. But then the, 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 the kind of scaffolding allows for the, the canopy to become a vertical billboard, um, almost like a kind of art gallery that's supported by cars surrounding it. Next slide, please. Imagine the experience of being able to display the cars, to be able to display your cars, but then reinforcing that by digital media. Kind of incredible overlay of imagery that further enhances your souped up car. Does this allow for more innovation and customization and individuality? We think it does. We think it's not just about the car, it's, it's, it's about the culture surrounding the car. And so it's a further kind of extension of that or projecting out. We see this as a billboard for, for the new age, not just with respect to the technology that you can see here on the site, but then how that translates over the internet and how you can actually represent yourself to kind of mass culture. I mean, we are in Los Angeles after all. Next slide, please. 
And then what's the potential if, if you, you can have a kind of media at night or you're allowed to kind of view media at night? Can you create a new type of social gathering around that? Because there's a kind of infusion of the cars uh, along with a, a social piece to the north. And so really, how do you create these serendipitous moments of new types of engagement because you've allowed these new activities on the site to occur simultaneously? Next slide, please. And so if we look again from the perspective of the car and, and, and go back to uh, uh, the, the kind of initial charging, um, and as you can see here, you have canopy overhead. Next slide, please. And then imagining kind of the art and, and how that's reflected in the cars themselves. And it's always nice to create a kind of reflective Lamborghini in your imagery, but how there's a, a, there's a kind of relationship between those two. Next slide. And then how, how we're really uh, creating kind of more direct connection between the, the cars and digital media. Next, next slide, please. And projecting out as, as we were describing before. So the, the final slide of our, our presentation here, uh, next slide, please. Is really about recharging LA. It's, it's a reinvigoration of the potential that we see in this type of, of typology or infrastructure. And it's a new energy and, and really a new opportunity to promote these cultures. Thank you. Matt, I can definitely imagine a future of mobility in LA that's totally recharged and connected to its culture. I can also imagine your son waking up in the morning going, Dad, can we go to the EV station, please? Um, our subsequent research um, where we multiply this across 550 sites with development have demonstrated we can also add 20,000 dwellings, ha house 40,000 people, create 43,000 new jobs, and more, most importantly, create 300,000 square feet of these um, energized uh, spaces and parks. Thank you very much, Christopher. Terrific. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of the teams for those presentations. We're going to move into a discussion now with a really remarkable group of respondents. Let me introduce them quickly. Uh, Professor Genevieve Giuliano is the Ferraro Chair in Effective Local Government and the Director of the Met Trans Transportation Center at the Saul Price School of Public Policy at USC. Michelle Kinman is Director of Transportation for the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, LACI, and manages the Transportation Electrification Partnership that we mentioned earlier. Peter Kleinberg is representing ESI Ventures, a private real estate investor. They're actively involved in multiple projects in the fashion district, as well as being owners of several contiguous parcels to 749 South Los Angeles Street, including the surface parking lot that some of the teams have been using as connection uh, through the site to Main Street. Uh, Matt Peterson is president and CEO of Lacey and in that role chairs the Transportation Electrification Partnership, is the managing director as well of the Lacey Impact Fund. He was the very first chief sustainability officer for the city of Los Angeles in Mayor Garcetti's office and serves as board chair of Climate Mayors. Spencer Reeder is director of government affairs and sustainability at Audi of America, where he is responsible for leading the Audi US public policy voice on zero emission vehicles, including battery electric and associated infrastructure, as well as Audi's work on alternative fuels technology. My mayor's office colleague, Michael Samuelon, heads up electric vehicle efforts in the sustainability office um, for Mayor Garcetti. His focus is on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution through electrification as well as reducing energy and water consumption in municipal facilities. And finally, Christina Slayton is manager for site acquisition and portfolio management at Electrify America, where her por portfolio includes all real estate acquisition activities for Electrify America. Let me begin, and I wanna just uh, remind the respondents that they're free to pose particular questions to the teams if they would like, and we'll also have a more general discussion um, let me begin with Michael. Um, you think about electric vehicles and, and this question of uncertainty and the evolution, the ephemerality perhaps of this building type. So I'm curious for your responses, particularly from that point of view, how we plan for this building type that may be so changeable, so malleable, perhaps even ephemeral over time um, from the perspective of uh, public policy in the mayor's office. Michael. Thank you, Christopher, and thank you to uh, all of the teams that just presented. Um, 
That was spectacular. Uh, definitely more than I had hoped for uh, coming into this, not not knowing what uh, imaginative people can come up with. Um, I think to your question, Christopher, it's it's really, as you said, and, and the groups um, did speak to this quite a bit that, you know, we're talking about a plug like your phone uh, used to use a few years ago, and we're probably looking at something inductive like your phone is using now or your inductive toothbrush uh, and maybe other wireless technology in the future. So. Um, being able to take these uh, parcels uh, all around the city and do something modular with them is going to be pretty uh, important. And then um, I think the, the first group definitely spoke to the fact that there's going to be automation and autonomous vehicles in the future. Who knows what it all means? So um, flexibility is really important there. And I was I was excited to see all of that. Um, I've got some technical questions, but maybe I should hold off on those right now. No, you could maybe raise one or two. That, that seem most pressing? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make them quick. Um, for both the first and the last um, uh, presentations, I'm curious because they both had sort of this concept of power that's sort of underneath and modular. It's um, a brick sort of system for the last presentation and the first one. Um, it's this moving robot um, type scenario. And I'm just curious sort of how you envision that working, I guess, with the first presentation, um, as the vehicle moves through over the course of the half hour or hour, is it being plugged and unplugged, or are we expecting that it's inductive or, or something like that? And then similarly, um, I guess, and it, maybe this is what the engineers will be for eventually, but um, how the power is running through those blocks uh, in, in that third presentation. So let's start with, with Dan uh, from the first presentation on that, that question um, and then hand it over to Wood, Woods Baggett if you guys would like to make a quick addition. Great, yeah, thank you. So that is, um, that is a question that we grappled with a little bit. We do feel that in sort of the future iterations of this, it will probably all be inductive, which simplifies the problem in probably magical ways. But we did work through the scaffold to develop a kind of racking system that allows a track to run along. And so what we imagine is that the plug would actually go into the car in a very manual way, but then could run along the overhead track where the power is actually being supplied from the scaffold above as opposed to from underneath. We did a couple test simulations to see if this was sort of feasible. I wouldn't suggest that it's fully worked out, but uh, we did organize our kind of system of mobility to move cars in a way in which the, the plugs could follow them along overhead along this kind of tracking system that belongs to the scaffold. Terrific. Uh, Woods, ba Woods Baggett folks, quickly. You sure. So, <laughs> of course, yeah. So we, we actually kind of imagine it as, Michael, as a, as a built up section. So the way in which the energy would kind of transfer across the modules, I mean, we, we wanted to be uh, respectful of, of having the, the opportunity to kind of switch this out in the future, um, but it's almost built up off the ground. Mm. Mm, terrific. Um, let me put a similar question um, to Christina uh, Slayton from Electrify America. You also think of, about these questions uh, for a living. Um, what responses or questions do you have for the, for the teams? I found the presentations very informative. And in reference to the last presentation about gearing it towards a more destination rather than just a charging station I thought was extremely interesting and I wanted to bring up that's similar to our approach here at Electrify America for some future sites turning them into mega sites uh, and not only having charging available but also for example we've even looked at the ideas of having some food trucks at the mega sites that we are hoping to deploy in the future or for example, uh, having an area where uh, chargers could go into a cafe and we would actually be the ones running that cafe. So in terms of the last presentation, what barriers do you see uh, in place as of now to get to that future viewpoint of charging more as a destination? Nick, did you want to speak? 
to this? Yeah, um, look, if you, if you create a, a place where people want to be, the cafes um, will, will, will thrive. If you just put it there without a purpose and an entertainment component to it, um, then there is some risk. So what we try and do is uh, create a purpose to go uh, above, above just charging. So we would support, most definitely um, support the addition of those ancillary services um, to enhance that opportunity. Terrific, thank you. And Professor Giuliano, let me turn to you. You think about these questions from the point of view of, uh, of local government, mobility, transportation policy, and public policy more broadly. Can I ask you for some responses to these uh, presentations or, or questions for the teams? Sure, uh, thanks very much. This has been absolutely fascinating. Um, so, you know, my day job is not architecture, so I just thought this was great. Um, it's caused me to think uh, about a, a several things, and that's what I kind of want to throw out to see, you know, how our panel, how our um, architects will react. Um, I was really fascinated by the idea of planned obsolescence because as I was thinking about this whole session, I started wondering, um, were there too many constraints placed on the architects, given that you could imagine a world where gas stations or charging stations are almost gone? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, maybe that was a bit of a constraint, but I thought it was really uh, interesting that we have, we should be thinking about the concept of charging versus the concept of um, putting fuel in your car today. And today, Probably we put fuel in our car once a week when we charge. We're going to do that every day. Um, and the timing is about the time I'm imagining to go to a car wash. Um, so that means a car wash absolutely every day. And what are people going to do with that? Um, so the idea of this being a destination, I think, is really important. But I'm actually wondering if it should be sort of attached to um the larger fabric of destinations and activities in other words do i drop my car here while i go to the office or while i do something else um, can i think of it in that way so i thought it would be interesting to hear from the architects of you know can how do you imagine this as being sort of an incidental that would not actually cost people real time like the car wash? Really great set of questions. And, and let me put um, that last part to, uh, to Jose and then Yaki. Do you wanna speak to that? Uh, that, that question of, of destination, but also something that we may do on a much more regular basis than we fuel our cars today. Not sure if we're our... not obsessed with fulfilling ah, we are not obsessed with fulfilling the place with multiple activities or uh, or or trying to create a kind of fun palace in uh, in in this plot we don't believe in mm -hmm. that i mean i think that there are many many plots and not one million fun palaces in a city so so in somehow mm -hmm. and for us the concept the more important concept is that it's about time is that the charging stations are opportunities to enjoy having to stop 20 minutes and, and staying in a limbo, a kind, a kind of place, a nowhere, a place where you can do whatever you want and you don't need food trucks, you don't need, I don't, I don't know, all these kind of things. I mean, I, it's a completely different take. Mm. I think that the, the enjoyment of time is key. And creating pavilions that really allow you to enjoy the air, uh, healthy air, the sun, the, the breeze, et cetera, et cetera, is something that even, I mean, I have to say commercially, is very open, but is absolutely interesting. So for me, this is the, the only important change that we are trying to um, manipulate architecturally. Which kind of environment can be can remind still to the gas station, but transform the experience into a kind of limbo where you can do whatever you, you are alone probably, you can enjoy conversation, reading, drinking, 
doing nothing. And this is quite important, uh, in, in my opinion, as a difference for the rest of the participants. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much. That question of the kind of um, after image of the gas station or what we keep from the gas station and what we leave behind is something that I think we'll be talking about throughout the sessions this afternoon. Um, Peter Kleinberg, you and ESI Ventures know this site quite well, and you've been thinking a lot about its future and talking with the city um, about, about the kinds of uh, programs that it might uh, uh, host. Uh, what are your questions or responses to the, uh, to the teams or, or more general thoughts about, uh, about this little slice of downtown LA? Sure, and to all the teams, uh, great work. It's always very exciting to see how um, sort of unconstrained imagination uh, comes up with interesting ideas. Uh, ESI, with the work that we've done on the site, uh, in particular the adjacent building at 755, which was pretty prominent actually in a couple of the presentations, uh, gives us an unfair advantage where we're familiar with some of the substructure or subsurface infrastructure and other impediments that, that may have changed the, the nature of the presentation. So really cool to see uh, everybody open their minds. The focus on space and community as much as functionality, I think was really fantastic. I think it represents exactly how we view the fashion district, which is a destination in LA, a place where you can gather, you can meet, and you can spend time by choice, right? I mean, there is certainly a compulsion because you need the gas or the uh, electricity for your car, but to go there and have it as an amenity rich place is something that we envision too, right? So um, really appreciated that. and. I also think, just as a final point, the sort of symbiotic relationship between what LADWP can do as an EV charging station with the private industry and how we're developing the office component and the retail component that we're envisioning, I think meshes really well with a lot of the vision that we saw, or that I saw in these presentations. So uh, no questions in particular, just really appreciated the thought given to it. And um, you know, we've had our own ideas and imaginations about the thought or about the site and um, just fun to see what, what yours turned out as. So. Super, super helpful. Um, let me turn to the, the Lacey duo, Matt and Michelle. You guys are coming off a summit thinking about transportation electrification across the whole spectrum um, of, of, of questions and themes. So I want to put um, the same uh, the same question to you two. Maybe we'll start with you, Matt. Um, responses, questions uh, of the teams, to the teams. Thanks, Christopher. Um, as you said earlier, it's great to see our conversation manifest into this today. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for pulling it all together. Um, you know, I, the car is the vernacular of Los Angeles and what we're trying to say here, obviously, is the plug is now hopefully the, uh, the uh, uh, I guess, the accessory to the vernacular of Los Angeles. Um, uh, it, to me, the designs represented uh, different, of course, iterations on the design uh, problem that you presented on with the site, which has its constraints, as any good design problem does. The uh, what I what I appreciate about the first one was the adaptability and the universality of it. The second team's uh, design had this beautiful organic architecture and and more of a free flowing uh, 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 you know, space. Uh, I could imagine sort of nap pods or meditation pods, you know, how could you, when I, when you described it, I, I wanted to disconnect from my screen as we often too, looking too much at our phone, we could just sit in our car and wait for the car to charge. Uh, and then the third team really built, built on that, the true, as I said, the vernacular of LA, that car culture, the, uh, I just had a discussion with one of our new board members who wants to fund Lacey to do some pilots of a, you know, retrofitting uh, old cars, uh, A, to make them more affordable, but B, potentially, you know, build on that car culture and, and custom car uh, approach we have here. So, you know, and, 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 and sort of the, 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 the resilience and adaptability, I think it was what spoke to me uh, uh, throughout all three, including the idea of adding a basketball uh, pavilion um, <laughs> and bringing physical activity, not just, uh, uh, the other activities that were implied and specifically addressed. Uh, I guess, uh, uh, to me, I'll ask the, uh, Jose and Anik, Inaki, uh, you know, what was the inspiration? You know, I, 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 as somebody that's gone to Europe enough and driv driven a car across Europe, um, the, 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 the 
the, the convenience stops, the, the truck stops, or the, uh, you know, the, the, the roadside stands, the food is often better than most cafes you can get in the U.S. Um, but they also, the design and interaction you find in those spaces, other than the store itself or the cafe itself, well, the, the, you don't usually see an espresso machine in a truck stop in the U.S., um, is, it, it, w was it, what was the inspiration for the cellular nature of, of your design? Well, I think that inspiration is based on organic design and nature, of course. Uh, I think that we have chosen uh, an hexagon as a uh, really flexible module that um, allows all kind of movement. But yes, I think that main inspiration is nature. We call these modules uh, trees or even sunflowers. So that's the proof that we are thinking about creating a more uh, comfortable integration between man and nature. Can I add? Uh... One very Spanish uh, inspiration is the beach uh, chiringu chiringuito. <laughs> you know the, the small uh, bars in the middle of the beach? Uh, mm. They are beautiful. They, you enjoy the music, you are relaxed. It's a, this is the point. <laughs> Terrific. Um, Michelle, our other Lacey representative, you've been thinking a lot about this transition over the decade, particularly looking ahead to 2028. So I'm curious for your thoughts. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to congratulate all three of the teams. I think it's clear that you all had your cooks in Mayor Garcetti's Ideas Kitchen. Really exciting to see all of these ideas on the screen in front of us. What I really like about all three of them is that you've all accounted for growth over time, whether that's over the years or over the course of a day or a week. And so I think that's really um, smart, very forward thinking. I also really like that you all have incorporated aspects of community in your uh, proposals. So really, really exciting. I'll offer just three reflections as you continue to iterate on these ideas going forward. Um, one is very specific, but we've been doing a lot of work of late with uh, truck companies, the manufacturers of electric trucks. And one of the things that I learned is that some of the major delivery companies, you know, sort of like the FedEx UPS sized trucks, they really are strict with their drivers. They wanna make sure that their drivers don't have any dings on the trucks or anything. And so they would not probably like the idea of a canopy over the truck portion of the uh, facilities of the future. So that's very technical, but just one thing to keep in mind. And Michelle, just to clarify that, what is it about the canopy that uh, would pose that kind of a risk? To the vehicle. What I have been told by one of the major delivery companies is that any extra poles or overhead structures just provides that much more opportunity for a driver to accidentally run into it. Got it. Got and it. some Makes of those sense. companies are very, very strict as they should be with their drivers about any sort of mishaps, even if they're minor. And so that would be something that you further iterate just to keep in mind that that canopy structure probably wouldn't be welcomed by the delivery companies for the delivery truck portion only. Um, and then just two other quick things, you know, I, I love what Nick said about these being places where you want to bring your kids, where your kids want to come. And to that point, I would encourage you all, and I think you've done this, even if you didn't explicitly state it here today, but to think about the safety aspects. I think going to a, a gas station, particularly I'll say as a woman, you know, at night is not really a place that I look forward to going to. So whether it's in the lighting or having attendance at some of the community uh, amenities that you've already thought through um, would be really helpful in terms of the safety aspects. And then last but not least, I'll just make a quick plug for education. Of course, you know, the folks who already have the electric vehicles are, are sold, they're bought in. But I think each of you has already built into your design proposals different ways where you could build in you know, education to the rest of the community about the benefits of electric vehicles and encourage even more people, whether it's on those billboards or those uh, film screens or what have you, you've got the ideas there. And then if you connect the dots to education, it'll be an even better way to grow this trans transition. But thank you all, great ideas. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, Spencer, let me turn to you from the, from the point of view of, a, of an automaker um, who's been thinking about uh electrification zero emissions vehicles um your thoughts and your and your questions for the teams yeah well and, and right not just thinking right but doing we've, yes. we've got five plug-in vehicles in the market right here in the us today and 
just announced yesterday the launch of production of the uh, e-tron gt which we're really excited about it's our new supercar really will supplant the r8 and i mean this gets to this idea that i saw in, in the presentations of of inspiration right of, of and as michelle said um <clears throat> motivating people uh, i think from our standpoint it is about inspiring uh something that hasn't been created before so i I mean, Matt and Michelle will tell you I was agitating to get involved in this because we're so passionate uh, as Audi, as a brand that um, speaks to uh, the hope for the future. Our tagline is Forschung durch Technik, which is German for, for uh, progress through technology. And this is precisely uh, what we see in these designs. Um, you know, just a couple because we we work on on the vehicle side and and think about the charging side a lot uh, and the experience of our drivers i'll share a couple of thoughts and then i do have some questions uh, for the teams um listen i think largely the charging experience at least in the us i have not driven an ev in europe yet uh has been a failure uh, frankly an unmitigated failure notwithstanding the new stations at some uh, of the providers like electrify america are starting to deploy now, um, but but the experience from our drivers has been been bad, right? Um, and 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 then on the cost side, and when you think about whether it's inductive charging, which I can comment on from a technical standpoint, um, there's trade-offs, right? Both on the vehicle side and the infrastructure side. And as you iterate on the design, I think maybe digging into some of those cost trade-offs will be important because that has the at the end of the day, the practical implication for what we can do, uh, but you can do those things beautifully, right? That that, that create a beautiful experience. Um, so just to to jump in uh, on the first design, something that that came to mind as I was watching the uh, the dynamic nature of the moving the vehicles around. Uh, one question, and and they can respond right away or, or at the end of my comments. But might you? Uh, depending on the the subterranean access, create a slightly elevated structure you could drive on, and the robotics would be in the infrastructure below the vehicles. The vehicles actually wouldn't move, but you'd have something moving underneath to move that uh, to the to the vehicle that needs to be charged. Mm. And 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 do you get not an efficiency improvement there on that by not having to move that actual vehicle? So just it, it was, that was sort of a minor minor thought. Um, I wanted to, to tap into the safety thing Michelle just talked about, uh, but from a different angle. Um, you know, we, as you visit a place over and over again, uh, you get a sort of a mental map of what the physic, the geography is of that space, and you, you don't have to pay as close attention, right? Even driving in your neighborhood, you sort of know where to position your vehicle or where to walk. And so I wonder, in some of the designs, from a pedestrian safety standpoint, I, I like the idea that, that they're flexible spaces and you can move things around depending on the time of day or what's going on, but might that create a safety hazard because people sort of grow to expect, oh, here's where the cars go, here's where the people are, this is where these activities occur. Uh, if that's constantly changing, I wonder if there's a safety dimension to that. Um, I, I like it, but I, I wonder from a safety standpoint if that's not a concern. And then on the third design, I love the cultural connectivity. I think it's brilliant. Um, uh, they, they, that would have the same sort of multi-use benefits, but also potential safety cons. I, I don't know. I'd love to hear the response to that. Um, and and you know, in terms of, uh, I guess this emerged in a couple of the inductive charging, and maybe that was part of the design challenge. But I will just tell you what we what we know thus far is uh, that although there was a lot of initial promise with inductive charging. Uh, it doesn't actually seem to be as beneficial from a cost trade-off standpoint. The sensitivity about where the vehicle precisely needs to be aligned over that inductive charger is, is actually more sensitive than we had hoped. And so the cable charging, and, and uh, our colleague at Electrify America can probably elaborate on this. The cables may be with us for a while. So as you iterate, thinking about a pedestal or some variation on that pedestal design is probably important in case the inductive charging just doesn't really materialize. Those are my initial thoughts. Super helpful. Let me turn back to Christina what, and, and others on the panel. Um, thoughts about that question of um, ductive charging and some of those complexities and, and whether you share that, um, that point of view that Spencer just raised. 
Hi, yes. No, agree the cable is going nowhere anytime soon. We have been looking at alternatives for charging stations in general, but it's more as of now reducing the footprint of those chargers. Unfortunately, the cable is still there. Uh, we've also been coordinating with autonomous vehicles and design of charging stations in that sense as well, but even those designs are still including the cables, unfortunately. So as of now, they are still in future designs and I do not know of any models that do not include a cable uh, of the design. Thank so you. a little yeah. feedback on that. I would echo. I mean, well, we certainly think the potential of wireless charging is there. You know, I think cables is, if not here for a long time, here to stay potentially. Um, yes. When you're talking about the amount of electricity that we're going to move through into the car, it's so much different than what we're seeing in, con in inductive charging and other um, electronic uses. Uh, and, you know, the good news is by putting the electrical capacity where where it's going to provide uh, the electricity through the through the plug, it does allow for the potential adaptation. Whether it's a shift in the physical plug at some point, which I, I doubt will happen too, but but you never know, um, and, or to inductive charging, I think uh, that that allows for it. But uh, you know, I think for the uh, for for a very long time, we're going to see the plug stay here, and it's just there's too much electricity moving through. I think to for the risk and and just the functionality of it uh, as well. Right, um, right. That's that's super good to know. And I, I just we're, we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to put one question quickly out to the group, and maybe we can get one or two quick responses. I was really struck by the number of teams that talked about iconography. Um, and we know with the gas station that that's such an important part of the architecture, the color scheme, the branding, which has to do with a small, relatively small number of, of, um, of gas station companies or fuel companies, um, and they have a regional character, of course. You see different kinds of gas station architecture in different parts of the country. I'm just wondering if, if some of you have quick thoughts about the, who will actually be responsible in the charging station environment for you know, making those decisions about branding, iconography. Of course, we're, gonna, we're looking at a different set of clients than we are in the gas station world, although We'll talk about that a little bit in the next session, but just a quick question as we close about that um, that issue of iconography and, and sort of architectural branding, if you will. And anyone can jump in on this one. Christina here with Electrify America. I can weigh in a bit on that. Please. Uh, for example, on Electrify America's end, Branding is very important to us, right? Because we see that as our future, our brand. Uh, so you, we try to reach that at every one of our stations, right? Uh, same type of chargers, uh, the branding of making sure we're the high speed chargers, right? 150 and above. It goes with that brand that we offer the fast chargers. Uh, you'll notice that all of the EA chargers, we have the, the green glowing uh, to kind of give it that icon look. So I think branding in terms of chargers is extremely important because it helps our customers identify with us. And they're more likely to pull up into an Electrify America charger, not only because of the icon and what our brand represents, but that they know we you know, offer that good charge and we, they can always pull in there and our chargers are going to work and they're going to be able to, you know, fill up fast and, mm -hmm. and move on with their day. Terrific. You know, I'll, only I'll quickly sure. add, add just, you know, the iconographic opportunity is there. Um, you know, the base, the, the actual functionality is a commodity. Uh, it, it's what Electrify America is adding to it or uh, you know, EV box or others that are trying to make their, uh, their charger an artifact, a, a design element. Um, there's opportunity in that, but in the end, it's the functionality and it's a core, it's a commodity, but, but I think what is around it is what you were also talking about. So given most charging is not gonna be controlled you know, at a gas station anymore, it's, there's, right. a, there's a more, more opportunity to play with it. 
And Christopher, so we'd like to think the sponsors could also contribute to an arts po program or an events program in LA. You're, you're making the bucks. Let's give some back to the community as well, yeah? <laughs> okay, a challenge laid down. And um, thank you. We should wrap up there. So we have time for a little bit of a break before our second session. Um, let me extend my thanks and gratitude to all of the teams for their presentations and all the respondents. Many of them will be back joining us for the second session, um, which will begin at 2.45. Thanks so much, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Moving right along. Uh, I'm Christopher Hawthorne. This is Pump to Plug. I want to welcome any new audience members and welcome back those of you who joined us for the first session on the architecture and urbanism of charging stations for, for electric vehicles. In this second session, we'll be moving on to consider the future of LA's many gas station sites. Uh, we'll be having presentations from uh, two firms, Anaba Williams and Perkins and Will, and we'll have a discussion about the issues, themes, questions raised by those presentations. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce and, uh, and have a, a brief conversation with the photographer, Jonna Ireland. As soon as we decided we were going to um, organize a virtual symposium of this kind on the future of gas station sites and the architecture of charging stations, I knew that I wanted to have some photographic component. I knew I wanted to try to chart uh, visually the importance um, in terms of architecture, in terms of civic identity, the important role that gas stations have always played in Los Angeles is really among our most chief, uh, among our most recognizable emblems, symbols of the city, I think for better and for worse. And this is a building type that at least in its traditional form will begin to fade as the transition to electrified mobility accelerates. And I'm really thrilled that Jana agreed to take on, um, uh, take on this commission of, of photographing some of our most architecturally significant uh, gas stations. So we're gonna see two batches of photos um, that Jonna has produced for this event. The first, which we'll talk about now, is a collection of black and white photographs. Um, and then in the second break between the second and third panels, uh, we'll see a collection of, of color photographs. Um, so Jonna, I'm going to hand it over to you with our thanks for taking on this project and um, allow you to talk a little bit about uh, these remarkable photographs that you've produced for us. Thank you, Christopher, and thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this and make these new photographs. As he said a, a few minutes ago, you'll see another group later, a group that's in color, but I wanted to speak specifically about this group, this black and white group, which is kind of my favorite. I knew as soon as I was asked to do this work that I wanted pictures in black and white, I wanted pictures at night, and I wanted pictures that are very horizontal. Gas stations are traditionally very horizontal, so I wanted to capture that wideness of them in these pictures. And I knew that I wanted to photograph at night because of the way that gas stations use light. They're really designed to be beacons and attract you to them at night and also be completely functional at night so that you can fill up your tank and go over to the convenience store in relative safety and and have it all be uh, be convenient and work well so i wanted to capture that and shooting in black and white allows me to look at the way that these gas stations use light without the distraction of thinking about the way that they use color color is very important when we're talking about branding as uh, was being discussed right before the break but I wanted to look really just at the architecture and this was a way to do that. But I also became interested in things like this, things like the ground underneath where all the cars are parked. I became really interested in the way signage is used at these stations, official corporate signage, ad hoc signage, such as signs that say that something is out of order and you need to use another pump and um, the California specific signage as well that relates to our propositions in the state and the way that 
warnings have to be listed for using the gas station. So if you looked at the entire body of work, you would see all of these different aspects of the stations. This station is really interesting. This is the only station that I saw with EV charging plugs. There were several stations that had alternative sources of fuel, but only this station, which is on, I believe the largest lot that I visited, had EV charging plugs. So kind of off to the side around where I'm standing with my camera, there are space for two cars to park for a long time and charge up their electric vehicles. Here is Helios House, which was designed by Johnston Mark Lee and Office DA. Um, many of you probably know this station and it was really exciting to photograph because the surface means that light is reflecting off of it differently all the time. I visited this station first thing in the morning as well, and it was a completely different experience photographing it in the morning and photographing it late at night. One other reason that I wanted to photograph at night, I think is that in this particular time during the pandemic, I'm home with children all day. So to me, nighttime represents my time to actually get work done. So when I think about this work later, it will be meaningful to me to look at it and know that I was running around all day and doing Zoom school and making lunch and then going out and doing this work later. And that it also uh, kind of fits in with this idea of the way stations use light and the way that they, that, that use of light within the architecture is a very iconic thing about gas stations. It's something that was really fun to look at and really exciting to do in this work. Well, here we have Jin Wong's iconic 76 station in Beverly Hills that he did for Pereira and Associates. This was really fun to photograph. I actually photographed this station three different times. The second time I got there after it closed so there were no lights but the third time I was able to get in very very quickly before all the lights went out so you can see there are cars in the way I'm mostly trying to avoid cars but at this point I'm just trying to get this beautiful station and the way that it uses light and it also uses light in a really interesting way after the station is closed some of the lights turn off but not all of them so I liked looking at it both ways as well as looking at it in the daytime Shana, this is from that station as well. Thank you so much. I I wanted to ask you just to talk briefly about the color photographs and so ahead of um, the audience seeing those later in the program. Any thoughts about, um, you talk so beautifully about how these uh, gas stations look at night and your desire to photograph and, and the ways in which um, that approach works for black and white. What about the color batch that we'll see a little bit later? I really do tie the color to that brand identity. Mm. So I think of uh, the pictures that are really red and yellow are typically at, at shell stations. I was kicked out of two different shell stations as I did this work mm. or the um, red and blue of mobile stations. It lends kind of, at the, I think the word you used when we were talking about it was energy. It's kind of a different energy and, and the work does something different and maybe feels a little bit more contemporary when you look at it in color. Oh, terrific. Um, let me thank you again for this fantastic work. And John is much too modest to mention this, and I will, I will um, on her behalf, give a plug to her new book um, on, the, on the work of Paul Williams. It's called Regarding Paul R. Williams, A Photographer's View, a, a, a really beautiful um, and smart book about um, the architecture of Paul R. Williams um, through the eyes of, of John as, as a photographer who really shoots uh, architecture as well as anybody I, I know working in Los Angeles. So we're, we're really privileged to have you part of, uh, be part of the program. Thanks again for these, these beautiful photographs. Thank you. We will now uh, move into the presentation section of this second category, looking at the future of LA's gas station sites. And this was a, a challenge that we put to the teams um, that was open-ended in a lot of ways. Um, we have more than 550 gas stations within the city of Los Angeles. Um, 
and they are owned by a diverse group of owners, of course. Some of those owners of gas stations, I think, will be quite interested um, in working with the city and thinking about alternative uses or transition to future uses post gas. Others will be less interested in that set of discussions. And these gas stations, as we'll see in these two presentations that will soon follow, play a really uh, um, a rich variety of roles in communities as public spaces, community spaces, as retail spaces, and in other ways. And of course, um, because so many of them occupy corner locations, um, it will be really important for the city to think about this transition. Um, so we really put to the participating firms this question of how the city, how the mayor's office, how the, the, the Department of City Planning, how the Department of Transportation, other uh, departments in the city should be thinking about this transition and thinking about these sites in the aggregate. Um, there's no city that we've been able to find. We, we, there certainly may be efforts underway that we're unaware of, but we're not able to find any other cities that was kind of thinking um, in the aggregate about a proactive strategy for these for these sites. And we're really excited to, to see what the architects have come up with. So presenting in this category will be Jeffrey Anaba from Anaba Williams Architects uh, and Jan Krimsky and, and Martin Leitner from Perkins and Will, the, the Los Angeles office of, of Perkins and Will. And we will reconvene after the two presentations and we'll have a discussion similar to the one that we had in the first category and all introduce the new respondents that will be joining us for that part of the program after we reconvene. So at this point, I will hand it off with, um, with real pleasure to Jeffrey Anaba from Anaba Williams Architects. Hi, Christopher. Thank you so much for the invitation to participate. We're super thrilled to be able to um, contribute to the ideas here today. Um, we started by considering environmental justice in the context of the 2035 mandate, <clears throat> specifically how it may affect some communities more than others. We want to look at the neighborhoods where there's a high correlation between low income and high levels of chronic health ailments to see how the gas station can improve the level of health and well-being. At the same time, we thought about the consequences to gas station owners and operators from large property owners, single station owners, and leasees. We're interested in thinking about what can be done with gas station sites so that gas station owners and franchisees don't go the way of the taxi medallion holder, meaning holding on onto an asset that has little value as technology evolves. Um, so um, I'm gonna present uh, the video um, that we did um, you'll have to excuse me, I have a, a bit of a cold. Um, so um, <clears throat> if, I, if I drop off, um, luckily it's, it's good for you to know that there are closed caption texts. So um, if that does happen, by all means, please read along. Um, is it possible to see the video? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. Oh, listen to this song. I love we this song. We are that we drive. Things are gonna be easier. Our memories growing up. You're admired, don't give it up. Our collective experiences. Our emotional highs and lows. Even our means of survival. Are connected to the car. If the car is part of who we are, then the gas station is our common space. Can you turn up the volume, please? I need to get some unleaded. What do you do for It's a where living? we people watch, where we talk to strangers, and connect with people we know. It's for celebrations and performances. Everyone goes to the gas station. Sometimes a girl can do everything. <laughs> Ed, you know, what should people say? The gas station is standardized. Gas stations, maybe. Uh, yeah, the fact that they can just the same the space is everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah, or less. There are over 550 public spaces in LA. Right. 
With 2035 approaches, the poorest Angelinos will have the toughest time replacing their gas cars. Many will want to defer that expense as long as possible. Keeping gas stations through 2035 in some neighborhoods will help sustain communities by maintaining a way to get to jobs, schools, places of worship. <clears throat> Stations can be for staying in addition to going. They can be an infrastructure for residents as well as an infrastructure for cars. Gas stations already provide other services. Their main source of profit is the market. <clears throat> stations can expand their services and revenue. Neighborhoods should get more amenities in their common spaces. LA's poorest neighborhoods, in LA's poorest neighborhoods, people experience the most serious health challenges. Areas with the highest levels of poverty, shown in purple, have the highest levels of asthma. cardiovascular disease and low birth weight. In neighborhoods with the most severe economic and health burdens, we propose to keep and reinvent the gas station. There are roughly 165 stations in the city's most stressed neighborhoods. Those stations can support the health and well-being of residents. Stations will be points in a network of health-oriented common spaces. Travel to by foot, bike, or metro. Is it possible to turn up the volume, please? Here are two proposed sites. One is in South LA, the other is in Boyle Heights. On Slauson, there are six gas stations between Crenshaw and Blue Line. The MTA's rail to river plan will convert an unused track on Slauson into a bike path. Stations along it will become stations that residents can walk and bike to, hang out and enjoy. before continuing on, connecting to the Metro or exploring elsewhere. On Soto, there are seven stations between Olympic and the 10. As part of the city's mobility 2035 plan, Soto will receive a bike path. Residents will be able to stop at stations along the way between venturing to Hollenbeck Park, the Sixth Street Viaduct, connecting to the Gold Line, or heading north to Lincoln Park. To build on the iconic image of the gas station and offer more shade to communities, stations will have added canopies. Like standardized gas station construction, the canopies will be prefabricated for low cost assembly. On the test case site here at Slauson and Broadway, the ground is divided into areas to gas up and to stay. The kit of parts will complement the canopies. It includes bases, planters, bike racks, curtains, tables, benches, chairs, restrooms and showers. The parts can be combined in a variety of permutations to host local businesses. Bases for the canopies will rest on grade to avoid remediation, which is the main cost barrier to adding permissible uses on site. The kit of parts can be arranged, for example, into a cafe, a community meeting space, or a food market. Over time, as gas demand wanes, other activities can expand on site, like the food market shown here. To strengthen the community, 
the kit of parts can be organized to best suit a neighborhood's health and well-being priorities. To operate financially, the kit of parts can offer the infrastructure desired by businesses who lease space. As a larger mobility plan for LA, the station to station lines will connect to Metro rail stations. Adding a finer grain to our public transit network. The station lines will connect to adjacent parks and existing paths leading to urban outdoor spaces throughout the Southland. By connecting urban outdoor spaces with well-being corridors, station to station echoes the 1931 Olmsted vision and lays the groundwork for an urban plan right for the climate and culture of LA. Stations have existed as important spaces in cities from the inn to the airport. As their technologies peak, stations don't have to be destroyed. Once gas fueling is no longer needed, we propose to preserve stations and their open spaces. As the city densifies, the land around stations will offer development opportunities for station owners and partners that will offset the station's operating costs and benefit from their proximity to this base in the community. While today gas stations are a symbol of environmental threat, in the future stations can be a symbol of a healthy ecosystem. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, really fantastic work. And it, it reminds me that uh, several years ago, we did a third LA event on the lawn, another one of those emblems of second LA, the post-war city, um, that really this whole series has been trying to argue those sort of tropes of second LA that we sometimes think of as eternal, have a before and an after. Um, very, very similar, although your, your perspective was quite different. I think the preservation aspect, particularly in terms of open space and, and, and thinking about, um, even potentially thinking about air rights um, as part of this equation is something I look forward to discussing when we, when we get to the latter stages of this, um, uh, of this section of the program. So thank you so much. Um, and we move now to Perkins and Will. So I'm going to hand it for the next uh, presentation in this category to Martin Leitner and Jan Prinsky. Gentlemen. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Christopher. I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Seeing it full screen, good. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Jan Krimsky. I'm the design director for Perkins and Will Los Angeles. Hi, I'm Martin Leitner. I'm the urban design leader at Perkins and Will Los Angeles. So here we are. It's Beverly and La Brea. It, it's LA. It's the landscape that we all know. Uh, we've got three gas stations on one corner and a, and a strip mall on the other. So when we got the brief, we got really excited quickly because in particular, the scale of 550 gas stations across our cities is great network opportunity. 
and in particular the prospect of them actually going away and becoming this canvas that we can play with, you know, considering the auto-oriented legacy of urban development in LA and all the negative effects of that, carbon emissions, poor health outcomes, uh, severe injury, death, even the inequity in car ownership and, and the need to have a car to really fully embrace the life just struck us. And the gas stations are the, li the, the lifeblood of that, the infrastructure, they're part and parcel of that. So when we looked at this, we immediately thought, well, if we could get rid of that aspect of these sites, uh, this car-centric, what a great opportunity. So of course we have this kind of love-hate relationship with gas stations. You have the standard gas station on the bottom left. Um, how do we transition those into a future that uh, where gas is less necessary? We looked at other examples uh, in Canada. You, you see examples of gas station reductions of, of close to 40 percent. And and what's happening with those sites there? Um, it, it shows that not all sites get redeveloped. Uh, that that the cost of remediation can be quite high and quite time consuming. And so some sites that don't have the real estate value where remediation is actually higher than the cost of the real estate, um, re uh, they, they remain vacant. And so we started to think about in Los Angeles, maybe that's not so much the case. Real estate values are quite, quite high here, but still what are some of the outcomes that might start to inform policy as, uh, as we look at these sites being less and less necessary for the use of dispensing gas? So as we were thinking about how can we look at this a little bit more realistically, uh, Jan shared this, uh, this uh, episode of Radiolab that was a really interesting uh, exercise done almost a year ago now by uh, uh, a group of uh, Washington DC insiders that played scenarios around election outcomes. What if there was a close election? Uh, what would happen if we started um, questioning electors, trying to switch out electors, taking court, uh, to court election outcomes. All of these things were out there. Um, obviously nothing that would ever happen. Uh, but we thought it was a really, really great way to uh, explore uh, somewhat more realistically the dynamics around gas stations, the economics, whose voices would be most important, and, and the role of the policymaker. Yeah, a little bit of sarcasm there. They actually predicted things that very much are happening. Uh, and so we thought, what an incredible tool to have an engagement. Uh, where we could maybe start to understand some of these scenarios with a broader group of people at the table. Uh, let's bring in some policymakers. Uh, let's bring in some developers and have a big conversation about it. Yeah, so we essentially laid out a somewhat simplified version of reality and uh, brought in several roles. The mayor's office, the developer Jan already mentioned. We also wanted to have constituents there. And, we simplified LA into two groups of constituents, which is obviously completely inadequate, but uh, worked for our game. And then finally, we uh, brought in the activist, and we really wanted to make sure that there's an activist role in pushing for some of our bigger goals, societal goals, as we think about the future of development. And starting with this, we really developed a game board. So yeah, we, a little bit of a sidetrack for us, um, you know, we, we, uh, we were inspired by Catan and we were thinking about, you know, how do you create this really great engagement um, around, uh, around a, a kind of game-like conversation with all these people. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say that it'll take, it'll take us 10 minutes to tell you the rules of the game. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to dive into it that deeply. But the important thing is that we really studied two scenarios. One where we had uh, uh, subsidies for remediation and one where we didn't. Uh, we also looked at two different types of sites, uh, a suburban site, which is represented by the orange, and an, a higher value urban site, which is represented by the pink. Yeah, and to, we were going to test this with some other folks, but before we got there, we needed to test this ourselves and uh, got off to a rough start, but we got better and better, and we actually got better and more adept at really interestingly playing the roles uh, of the different parties. Uh, our, some of our colleagues blew us away of, of, with their uh, uh, money-minded development impressions. Um, I ended up often being the policy makers, coming up with really uh, outrageous ordinances that you, we would apply to the gas station sites. And, and Jan uh, became the activist who, who was, uh, was engaging and uh, uh, coordinating even before we, we quite knew what we had to uh, uh, advocate for. 
Yeah, what became immediately obvious is for the activists and the community members to have a strong role in the outcome, uh, we needed to be extreme. Um, I got to the point where I was, I was collecting uh, signatures on round one, we were supposed to be doing introductions and really starting to set up you know, a ballot initiatives before I even knew what those initiatives would be for, uh, which is a really sort of a, a key takeaway. It'll come back around later. Yeah. So what we did is we actually then, as we refined this game, uh, invited some of our colleagues from across Perkins and Will, and then some of our favorite and most creative clients. Um, this, we played two game rounds. This is the first one. We invited uh, our, our friend Jenna Hornstock, at, uh, now at SCAG, who played the mayor's office setting policy. And then we had Yuval Shippet, who's uh, well known for his work on the Erewhon stores, and then Jack Nathan of Runyon Group, uh, who's known for the platform in particular in Culver City, uh, playing the development team. And uh, when the pros came in, we really learned a lot. They were very adept at navigating the process, the nuance, uh, some of the things that we, as uh, that we, when we played it, uh, uh, probably went a little f uh, further on 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 aggressively taking on ordinances. Uh, there were a few things that we learned in this game round. The first is that the remediation issue, the cost and the risk is a real obstacle. It was really something that people are concerned about when taking on a site. What am I stuck with in the end, delays, things like that. Um, what the team actually managed to do is to really thread a needle here and propose development on two of the sites, very thoughtful, live work, some retail, some artist studios, uh, really interesting, thoughtful urban development. But it was hard work to do that. Two other sites were not developed, uh, in a very savvy move, our development team actually uh, joined one of the community members in lobbying for a gas station to remain on one of the four sites. The other thing that we learned is if we make it too easy to develop these sites, if we take the remediation problem away by finding ways of funding it or somebody else taking it on, the value of these sites quickly goes up and the opportunity for interesting, thoughtful development really gets replaced by more of a cookie cut, a need to max out the site with uh, cookie cutter solutions. Yeah, in case you missed it, uh, Yuval Chipperut and uh, was it Paul that had the, the, the uh, passion for old cars? They got together and, and they actually kept one of the gas stations, which was definitely something we didn't expect. In our other scenario, we looked at uh, subsidies being provided. And uh, same as Martin, it was really uh, informative to see how the pros played it. Uh, and our, at our table, we had uh, Jeff Annenberg, who's a commercial developer. He was on the board of uh, the downtown LA inner city arts uh, program. Uh, he's involved in the development of Hauser and Worth, so not your typical developer. We also had uh, Mark Abiantos. He's the director of LA Plus, uh, which is a civic organization that inspires and advances Los Angeles positive urban futures. Uh, he's also co-founder and policy director for Abundant Housing LA, a volunteer organization that supports more housing of all types in the Los Angeles region. Um, so great guests. Uh, we also had a group of experts uh, from around the firm uh, joining us. Uh, the, the Really the interesting thing here was uh, Jeff was able to bring everyone together and find something for everyone. With, and, and Mark had a really light touch. He didn't have to use a lot of policy to get what he was after. Um, he relied on existing policy. Uh, and so uh, what happened in this game was that all four sites were developed despite some really low probability die rolls. And yes, we did have a, a die that we were rolling. Um, and, and so it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was interesting in the way that Jeff uh, incorporated automotive uses. Uh, he, he kind of placated uh, Richard, who was our activist, and created some art murals and things like that, and was able to do pretty much what he wanted. What was really interesting, though, was at the end, we brought everyone together, and uh, they kind of shared the results of their games with each other. Uh, and uh, at the very last moment, we asked for a last word from uh, global design principal Peter Busby. And what he said was this, I think the city should rezone the mall agriculture. I think they should be all be planted as orchards. The legacy of these sites in terms of the biosphere is significant. If you branded the idea, it could be a new symbol of LA instead of your heritage of the automobile, which, you know, Richard's a Canadian, or sorry, Peter's a Canadian, so uh, it makes some sense. But uh, at the same time, it kind of blew our minds. You know, for a moment we said, wow, uh, maybe we ought to be more visionary. Maybe we need to be the activist. 
So we were back to the question, what can you really do with 550 gas stations across the city? And what we started to put together in the sheet are typologies of addressing and seizing upon this big opportunity of this network of sites, right? And if you go uh, clockwise, starting the top left, we started thinking about open space, uh, green space, nature, ecology, and moving right, the social infrastructure, what are gathering spaces, amenities to bring people together to strengthen communities and, and, and bring things to communities where few things exist. Can't really talk about Los Angeles uh, without mentioning the housing crisis. So we need to, to think about what could 550 sites do in terms of housing. And then at the bottom left, we took some of the special sites, we call them the three and the four leaf clovers, those are the intersections where you have multiple gas stations together and explored some of the opportunities to fundamentally change the relationship between the street and open space in the LA grid. So we want to take you on a journey now of some of these different visions of, of potential futures for Los Angeles and talk about potential outcomes of doing some of these things. Um, an orange grove, food trucks. Imagine if that corner gas station became that. Um, LA park systems rank 49th in the nation. Uh, 550 new parks would mean more than double the existing 420 parks and facilities in Los Angeles. You know, that, that ranking of 49th, to put that in perspective, uh, that's also, that's, uh, coming, that's coming from the Trust for Public Land. To put that in perspective, San Francisco, Boston, Chicago, New York, they're all in the top 10. Uh, so that's, we're quite off in terms of being a, a global city in the United States uh, and, and, and being ranked that low in terms of our park access. The other thing we looked at is microgrids. Uh, obviously, gas stations already have a network of microgrids that could allow us to find an infrastructure scale that's between the kind of citywide scale and the residential scale that we currently operate at. What can some of these microgrids offer us? In this case, we're looking at uh, water collection or, or uh, in terms of the water collection potential of these sites. 190,000 gallons of rainwater per year, uh, and that would be enough to water 40 trees or several blocks worth of street trees around each of these, uh, each of these sites. Yeah. Ron Finley, who's also known as the, the gangster gardener, has really opened up our eyes to the importance of urban agriculture and urban farming, not just uh, for providing healthy food for folks, but also as a means of empowerment. And one of the key things about urban agriculture is that we need the honeybee, right, to pollinate. So what if these sites became a network of sites with apiaries on them, dramatically increasing the opportunity for urban farming across LA? And because we probably have some room left over, uh, why not go back to the microgrid idea and start having battery storage on a neighborhood scale? We know that that's right now happening in some households privately, but that's really only something for those who can afford to do that. Most people in Los Angeles can't. So why not offer this on the neighborhood scale, uh, communalize it and provide uh, a way to buffer the, the, the lows of solar and to also provide backup store power in, in case of an emergency. So back to open public green space, a pine forest. 67% of residents live within a 10 minute walking distance of a gas station. Uh, and that's interesting because only 62% of residents live within a 10 minute walking distance of a park. So if we look at 100% of these sites, uh, an average of 50 trees, a 1.3 million pounds of carbon could be sequestered per year. The other thing that's really interesting is if you overlay where uh, parks are most needed, uh, again, this is, is data collected from, uh, from the Parks and Rec uh, group that, that that overlays really nicely with where gas stations are actually positioned in the city. Uh, so there's a, a, a kind of a wonderful correlation there. Yeah. Going back to uh, urban farming and food, we know that access to fresh food and food insecurity is a real issue in Los Angeles. It actually doesn't take a lot of greenhouse space to uh, provide on a daily basis uh, fresh eating food for, for people. If we had a greenhouse like this, we would have the opportunity to provide daily fresh food for over 650,000 Angelinos, which is almost the number of the one in five Angelinos who face food, food insecurity. We know that a lot of these sites will need remediation. Uh, one of the ways of doing that is removing the, the soil, the contaminated soil. Uh, that leaves a wonderful opportunity for community uses. Uh, 
one hour of moderate activity each day can decrease cardiovascular disease by 20%. And that's the leading cause of death in LA County. Uh, something like a pool, which, is, uh, which can be used by people of all ages, is something that would, would have a great impact on that. Uh, we've, part, we've paired this up with a, a natural filtration, uh, water filtration uh, kind of landscape, uh, which could be wonderful all on its own. We know that a lot of people are looking at gas station sites as part of the next mobility network. But what if we looked at it as part of a different kind of mobility network that had to do uh, with mobility that is healthier, uh, more equitable, and, and, uh, and better for the planet as well? So what if we invested instead of gas stations or charging stations or, or AV uh, stalls into these bike pavilions where people can have their bike fixed, can ride their skateboard, can meet. And all of a sudden, this would be a network of uh, bike stations across the city. Think of the impact of 550 uh, bike pavilions and how they would change how we think about mobility in Los Angeles. Our homeless population in Los Angeles has grown to 40,000 people. If we built tiny home villages on every gas station site, we could provide temporary housing for 8,250 people. And that's nearly 20% of the city's pop homeless population. Similarly, if we took all of these sites and put about 40 or so units onto each site, we could create uh, 22,000 new housing units across the city. To put that into perspective, in the last year, in the last nine years, the city of LA built 88,000 new units. This would add an additional 25% on top of that, spread across the city in all kinds of neighborhoods, a huge impact. Here's where we switch gears a little bit. We're not gonna give you another fact. Uh, this is just an idea where there are uh, several instances where there are gas stations on every corner, all four corners of an intersection. What if we imagine bringing those spaces together and creating a hierarchy of space in our Los Angeles gridiron? Uh, and, and had the opportunity to create this kind of site of prominence that the community can share. Uh, imagine all of the things that can be done uh, when you aggregate all those pieces together into a larger one. Most of LA really we see as being part of a very regular grid of streets, but we actually have our share of funky intersections that are hard to navigate. And if we took some of the gas station space we had and say turn this into a roundabout, we could fundamentally change how these intersections work. These intersections are much safer for everyone to navigate. And if we do it right, we could actually, again, create an open space at the center that is a recreation space, that is a space for a cistern or some sort of other community infrastructure. This next one is uh, a terrifying term to me, who's a Los Angeles native that Martin introduced me to, Woonerf. Uh, this is the intersection of Crenshaw and Adams. And here we're imagining that, that Crenshaw and Adams becomes a shared street uh, basically a place where cars and pedestrians uh, co-mingle. Um, while it's difficult to imagine, uh, statistics collected from around the world, uh, wound nerfs are actually safer because drivers have to pay attention and slow down. Uh, but then also imagine the reclamation of the street as public space and the kind of places that we could create uh, when, when, we, when we think of, of these intersections in these terms. Martin, did you have anything to add on this? This is kind of your thing. Yeah, well, if, if we think about the fact that, that in cities, about 25% of our, of our uh, public space is, are the streets, this fundamentally changes our current equation of the 15-foot sidewalk strip amongst all the auto infrastructure there. Here, we're claiming the four gas station sites. We're expanding the sidewalk, turning this into a much larger contiguous open space. It, it's a fundamentally different way about thinking about the resource of public space in our city. So as we start to wrap up, um, we wanted to sort of think back on what is all this really adding up to? Um, and it made me think of, um, you know, basically this, this time when people were fascinated by the future. I grew up in the 80s when, you know, Skynet was going to take over the future and it didn't look so good. Um, but there's, there's this other era of, of time when uh, dreaming about the future was even a public attraction. Uh, this is the Futurama. Uh, this is, was, was uh, shown at the World's Fair in 1939. What's interesting about this is that this is General Motors' Futurama. And as we started to think about these kind of World's Fair um, 
visions that we that we see today, a lot of them feature auto oriented cities. And it's, it's interesting to think about that, that there was a movement, there was a conscious effort by automotive manufacturers and the auto industry to get people to be optimistic and welcome the, the automobile into the city, uh, that this was an effort. And maybe that kind of effort is something that we need to do today, uh, but doing it in reverse. Uh, another interesting tidbit, part of this whole culture, if you think about Disneyland, at one point in Tomorrowland, you had the home of the future and you also had Autotopia. Autotopia is still there. It's sponsored by Honda. Honda. Uh, they've recently rebuilt all the cars. Uh, I think it was in 2017 that they were refreshed and they are still gas. And, and so what should we do? On, right? <laughs> yeah. So as, as we think about this, uh, you know, we, we started by thinking and being more realistic. And we, we've actually come to the conclusion that if we want to seize on this opportunity, we have to be a little bit less realistic. And in particular, the policymakers and, and the activists uh, are really important. So we actually have three recommendations of, of how you could harness this opportunity. The first thing really is a conscious land use decision to prohibit the continued use of all of these sites for automobile oriented uses. That would fundamentally change how we see our intersections, what's going on, and who that's oriented to. Secondly, um, there should be a design expo, a real opportunity to take some of these sites and, and show prototypes of what you could do here, show the potential of the benefit to the communities. And finally, what you really need for all of this to work is, of course, fundraising, aggressive fundraising from all sources uh, to begin with remediation and then think about implementation. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present our ideas. Uh, we're thrilled to be part of the conversation. Uh, Christopher, back to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Martin and Jan, and thanks again to Jeffrey. Um, two really terrific presentations and a, a huge amount of material to dig into, and I'm, I'm really pleased with the with the respondents that we have to help us in that discussion. Let me introduce them now. Uh, Meg Bartholomew is head of impact and analytics at ERA or Erico, a new global experience consultancy recently launched, launched by Woods oh. Baggett, where she helps design uh, and placemaking teams use metrics to inform design with purposeful impact. And she's part of a team at Woods, uh, Woods Baggett that helped uh, think through these questions um, together with some of the, the architects you met earlier in the program. So we're really glad that she is able to join us. Next, uh, my colleague Shauna Bonston, Deputy Director for the Los Angeles City Planning Department, where she oversees the Community Planning Bureau. She's also uh, the department's Chief Sustainability Officer and the driver of an electric vehicle, importantly. Um, another of my colleagues uh, from the Mayor's Office, Julia Fain de Mordaunt, Associate Director of Mobility Innovation for the Mayor's Office, where she leads new mobility and goods movement policy for the city. She sits on the board of transportation, um, on the board of the transportation nonprofit, pardon me, Urban Movement Labs, and I'm hoping she'll talk a little bit about Urban Movement Labs, um, a really exciting new initiative, uh, and teaches a class on transportation technology and the future of cities at USC. Um, Rejoining us, Spencer Reeder, uh, Director of Government Affairs and Sustainability at Audi of America, who was with us for the first session. Uh, also rejoining Christina Slayton, Manager for Site Acquisition and Portfolio Management at Electrify America. Last but not least, uh, from USC, Yael, Professor Yael Walensky Namias, a professor of the Practice and Environmental Studies and Political Science at USC where she teaches courses on environmental politics and sustainability and has published a book titled Changing Climate Politics, U.S. Policies and Civic Action. Welcome to all of you and thank you. Um, Meg, I'm going to turn it to you for the, first, um, for the first thoughts among the respondents. But before we do that, I just have a couple of follow-up questions for our architects. And I want to start with, uh, with Jeffrey. Um, I'm interested in this question of remediation and potential needed subsidy for remediation at these gas station sites. You uh, looked into the question of what kinds of adaptive reuse might be possible without triggering a requirement 
for remediation. So I just wondered if you could just talk a little bit about those parameters and then I want to turn it to Martin and Jan just to talk about a little bit about maybe the cost. I don't know how much you priced out the cost of remediation, but if you have some ballpark figures of what kind of costs we're, we're talking about. Um, so let's start with Jeffrey. Yeah, I mean, it, it all started by looking at the, uh, the converted gas station um, that's now Starbucks uh, in um, Hollywood, West Hollywood. And um, we were really concerned that the cost of remediation would be prohibitive. So as far as we can understand from planning and zoning codes, um, so long as the soil is not disturbed, that any permissible C2 commercial um, uh, zone two site um, so a commercial two um, use is permissible on a gas station site. So therefore, any so long as the soil is not disturbed, uh, as far as we understand it, coffee shops, bakeries, bike shops, uh, anything of that sort is allowable. Terrific. And as we get into the discussion, if, if anyone among the respondents has some details or, or wrinkles to add to that, please do. Um, Martin and Jan, same, same question to you. Yeah, we were able to find um, the one figure that I saw was 350000 to remediate. Um, there was some also some kind of anecdotal data that we looked at, which was mm -hmm. what happens when you do start the process. Uh, if you've not successfully remediated, uh, what could happen is oily slicks form and during construction, and then you have to remediate again. And there's, there's obviously there's horror stories out there that doesn't happen consistently, but it's, it's certainly an issue. It's definitely a, a thing, something that will cause pause for people who are considering these sites for redevelopment. I agree everything that was said before. There's a lot of ways of, of using these sites without having to remediate, but as you get into that soil, um, you know, all those things are a factor. Martin, anything to add? Yeah, well, one thing that we were curious about, and initially in particular, when the thought was, well, maybe it's too expensive to remediate some of these sites, can we look at temporary uses? You know, the, the whole idea of taking sites, capping them, and then in particular, uh, addressing community needs that are urgent on a site like this uh, was something that we looked at uh, quite a bit as well. Hmm. I, I hope we can get into that question of, of, um, of evolving uses. That was, of course, such a big part of the conversation in the first session with charging stations, which is a kind of, um, will be a, a quickly changing building type, even an ephemeral one across a generation, perhaps um, in, in, in real contrast uh, to gas stations, which have been essentially these fixed objects in the urban scene for, for essentially um, uh, the better part of a of 100 years. Uh, Meg, as promised, I'll, I'll turn to you first. Um, you were part of a team that looked into this question. So I want to ask you, first of all, to talk a little bit about um, how you approached it and then, and then responses or questions for, uh, for the teams. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, I, I apologize for my background. We had our Christmas party earlier today <laughs> and I forgot that I left, but I'll leave it up. No, it's perfect. And so, um, so yeah, so our, our approach is really to look at all of the sites uh, across LA and apply quite a, a number of data layers over the top, a most uh, spatial, social, economic, and then apply a clustering model so that uh, essentially it would sort the, the sites into, into different uses according to the data layers that applied to that site. And it seemed to be, uh, it seemed to come out with some you know, quite clear clustering of across LA, looking at different, different areas, different sites, um, in a somewhat of a patchwork model, which was quite effective in, in the sense that you could apply affordable housing to some sites and then you could look at um, you know, you could look at other uses like park, like parks or to other sites, and it would also then correlate with a, you know, a financial model that you could on sell, you could kind of onward fund, um, forward fund uh, your development um, and forward fund social infrastructure. So I just had a question for, um, uh, for Jan and for Martin really about that, you know, could, is this a model that you had looked at if, if you, if you could, you did look at some quite high density sites you had some quite high density propositions perhaps could that uh the kind of could you turn it into somewhat of a um, you know fund model and forward fund some of those um more social infrastructure propositions yeah i mean i think you i think you have to otherwise you won't get them i mean that's that's kind of how our game played out is that if if you leave it up to the market um we're going to 
get some housing. We're going to get some sites that don't get developed. Uh, we're going to get more of what, what we see and we're, we're comfortable with. If we want to use these sites for new kinds of social infrastructure, if we want to really change our urban landscape, then we absolutely have to be deliberate about providing funding uh, to, to achieve some of those goals. And I 100% agree with you that this isn't about doing one thing on all the sites. This is really about being strategic and finding those correlations of what areas need what resources and where it makes sense to do some of these things. Um, but maybe we don't need so much of it dedicated to the car anymore. And, and that opens up 550 possibilities to do some really wonderful things. Mm. Terrific, thank you. And, and a quick question to Jeffrey before I turn to some other respondents. Um, I was really struck by the way in which you cautioned us to kind of slow down and not be too much in a hurry to, um, to transform these sites because of the important community role that they play and because of the socioeconomic complexities of the transition to electric car ownership, for example. Um, we have not, to put it mildly, been in Los Angeles um, uh, particularly successful attending to our architectural uh, heritage and, and, and um, uh, similar preservation efforts. I'm just curious about what point in your investigation did that notion strike you that really the point was not to focus on the transition, but actually more on the preservation and how um, it might be, it, it might really be uh, key to, to sustain the role that some of these gas stations play in communities, particularly in terms of open space. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, because they are de facto public spaces, we thought that that aspect of it was incredibly important. Um, at the same time, the idea that this has been in a super important typology to the city during the 20th century, early 21st, that it's something that would merit preservation um, by virtue of its architecture alone. But on top of that, the fact that it a <clears throat> adds shade equity to neighborhoods that don't have a lot of parks and, and don't have a lot of open spaces in a city that we know has the lowest park, one of the lowest park per capita ratios of major cities around the world. So the idea that <clears throat> something that could, that was seen in the past as a icon of environmental threat could be converted to a space that would be environmentally positive for the city was, was the motivator. Thank you. And it's really one of the connecting threads between the first two sessions had to do with the canopy as this kind of element that ought to be preserved for shade, as you pointed out, and cooling and for other reasons. Uh, as Christina noted in the first session, there are some complexities there in terms of access and particularly larger delivery vehicles, but I was really struck by how many of the presentations really um, propose keeping that sort of canopy type typography or sort of that, that familiar elevation of the canopy as an element um, in a in a transformed set of um, charging station and gas station sites. Let me turn to Shauna um, for a little bit maybe of an overview. I'm curious for your specific reactions to the presentations, of course, but if we could back up a little bit before you get to those, I'm curious about how the planning department takes on this question of a building type that's trans, you know, that's transforming itself or fading or or going away either by, by uh, because of legal changes, policy changes, as we see in the case of the switch to electric vehicles and the sunsetting of internal combustion engine sale, uh, vehicle sales, um, and, but not necessarily limiting it to gas stations. What, how does the planning department sort of take on that question of looking at these sites in the, in the aggregate, especially when they have private, you know, diverse group of, of private owners across the city? Yeah, I, that's a really great question. And I would say, I think historically, we've been reactive, probably more than necessarily visionary. Um, you know, we certainly do have the adaptive reuse ordinance. Um, but I think that one of the examples that I can think of, of us kind of predictive in the future um, has to do with parking, you know, so we are commonly looking at requesting above ground parking, being able to be um, converted and in future times to active uses. So that's something that we keep in mind as new construction goes up. But I, I do think that we tend to be fairly reactive as we see existing types of architecture and uses um, kind of fall out of uh, uh, the, the public interest. Um, and I will say like, th this is amusing to me because as someone, as a planner, I have been in some very strange positions of having to either 
review gas stations for sign compliance, which if you can imagine any specific plan that's kind of precious as to his signs, you know, gas stations are always the exception. They are just a true anomaly in terms of um, the, you know, design, the architecture, the signs, the placement, the curb cuts. Um, so it's, it's sort of exciting to me to think um, about what, what can be reused in terms of um, those sites. And uh, I can get into it like part of, part of also with planning, but sometimes we're not as um, maybe idealistic or kind of thinking big picture. Like some of my initial thoughts actually are what you do with those spaces that no other uses can really go into. Not so much, you know, like what what can what should they be? Um, and I guess to, to that point, I you know, again, this isn't very exciting and it's not really about making a statement, which is also really thrilling. This idea of making a real land use statement in contrast to what we've seen these these spaces be used for but there is some practicality and this is again how we kind of see land use and and the exchange of property but there's some practicality in terms of like the truck access like these sites tend to be very close to um freeways and major uh, arteries and they have enormous curb cuts again something that we'd not permit today and we don't permit with other uses and so it's interesting to me to think of that that large truck access where you don't often have that in other types of sites. And is there a moment where you think, are there other types of uses that need to receive product in that way um, that would be more disruptive in a different place and appropriate here? Now that's again, not as exciting. Um, and then the other thing, the canopy, I love the idea of kind of keeping the canopies. I think it is almost kind of absurd that we don't have more canopies, particularly with our, our weather, but also we don't have a ton of wind, you know. Um, so I very much like uh, the canopy concept. And I do think there, there's something to be said about being strategic. Um, as much as, again, it seems compelling to think of something that's really a reaction to the existing um, gas stations. Uh, you know, some of those, they, the sites differ quite a bit. And as I mentioned, some of the proximity to freeway, you know, if I make a list of the things that what is needed most, of course, open space, housing, 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 housing. But some of those sites seem problematic to me in terms of housing and particularly affordable housing. And yet this is often the circumstance where affordable housing is placed in the last kind of possible option. Uh, and then you've got freeway proximity, like what, what is the quality of life that you're kind of creating? And there's lots of arguments on that side. One is that we just need to create more housing. The other, it gets a little awkward if that's where our affordable housing is. Um, so I do think that there's, there's st some strategy that's appropriate in there. Um, I, I like the conversation about the food market too. And in my dealings with uh, gas stations. I will say that I've also heard the same thing that the food market tends to be um, kind of the number one, uh, you know, uh, money generator. And I think they're they serve a really important um, community use as a food market. And I, I like the idea of you know maybe that could be converted to something that's slightly more healthy or local food. But the idea of serving as a local market. Is a really important one and we're actually trying to for the first time in decades reintroduce this idea of allowing uh kind of smaller markets within residential areas or in these instances they tend to be in commercial um so those those are some initial thoughts that i have um the also the remediation is really big um I'd, i'm certainly not an expert on it and i i've personally followed some there's a gas station site in silver lake that I watched the last 15 years be kind of sitting there and it's finally being constructed as uh, housing now. I think I looked it up um, because I was just so curious what was happening. And I, I think there's something unfortunate, like there's something unfortunate about thinking about just capping it, you know, any of these sites and kind of moving on, almost unconscionable that we wouldn't go in and really clean the soil. Um, so that kind of just makes me nervous and I get it, it's, it's super expensive. Um, and I guess something that's interesting to me this is the idea of remediation, whether it's really active kind of soil, active soil remediation or the less, um, the, the less active version, like what are the temporary uses that could take place? Is it something built on a platform? Is if you can't touch the site at all, is it a mural? Like what, what can you do in that interim time? But I would say, you know, if it, if the city were involved or, and, and it probably does need to be like a large program like that, it does seem, problematic to not really um, address the soil 
and mitigate. Mm -hmm. yep. so. yep. um, if I could just add <laughs> one thing that we looked at was uh, phytoremediation, which is still mm -hmm. in an early technology. But the great thing is that it allows for or calls for the need for a landscape uh, as part of the remediation process. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and thanks, Shauna, for, for those comments. Um, let me turn to Julia. Uh, first, let me ask you to talk a little bit about Ur Urban Movement Labs and some of the subjects and themes that you're, that you're looking at in that project and maybe where the overlap is between the thinking you've been doing as it relates to that project and, and, and what you've heard in these presentations today. Absolutely. So I've been in the mayor's office for two years and just last year we launched something called Urban Movement Labs, which is the mayor's transportation solutions accelerator. And what that means is we knew that there are many vital parts of making a new transportation network for LA that we've got to work with uh, other levels of government that we have to work with businesses and most importantly, we have to work with the very diverse communities across LA. Um, to understand deeply what the challenges are that people are facing with our current transportation system, and then to come up with really creative and holistic solutions um, that do leverage partnerships with the private sector and do leverage um, technologies and different technologies uh, in order to meet those challenges. So um, Urban Movement Labs is doing a little bit of everything. Um, they are working on things like uh, personal delivery devices uh, and uh, uh, these sidewalk automated delivery robots that are connecting businesses to people who are now homebound by the pandemic. Um, it is working on mini mobility hubs. So really encouraging people to walk, cycle, connect to transit um, in these mini mobility hubs available in their neighborhoods, you know, within less than a 10 minute walk. Um, and they're also working on helping us think through uh, from a city perspective, how do we integrate these new mobility services with our existing transit services. Um, so uh, many exciting things, uh, many of which are actually relevant to the, the comments I wanted to make on the two presentations. Um, so first of all, Jeffrey, I am a sucker for punny titles. And so the station to station uh, was uh, just the cherry on top of a very beautiful presentation. Um, I mentioned, you know, in my role, I often have to stave off the privatizing of publicly owned space. So that example of the personal delivery devices. Um, but I really valued that this approach was about publicizing privately owned space. So incorporating the shade, incorporating parks, incorporating public gatherings. Um, so if I take that as the key theme, I think of, of your presentation, and then I back up and I think about what public benefit do we need, I do still think about retaining the transportation element of a gas station. Um, I think, you know, LA has moved beyond um, being just the car. We're the bus, we're the bike, we're the push cart, um, we're the train, we're the e-car. Um, and so could this not be a place where people get access to multiple types of transportation modes, uh, like the mini mobility hub that I was just referencing that Urban Movement Labs is working on. Um, and I think the second thing to, to Shauna's point is that um, we are see seeing a lot more of things being moved to people. And so we're increasingly needing space for staging deliveries, um, for urban freight, uh, for you know, all of the packages, et cetera. And that space, uh, if not put into some of these sites or other sites, might take up um, places where we would actually like to have affordable housing. Um, and so being able to reuse those sites potentially for something like that uh, would be really helpful. Um, the other way I, I thought about it uh, Jeffrey, and I liked how you included the economic side of this and the fact that we don't want to um, push out, you know, gas station owners and, and franchise um, holders um, is about creating new value for those owners, new economic opportunities, new jobs. Um, and I think, um, you know, on the theme of transportation, being able to demonstrate, um, to do some training for that next generation of, of transportation things, um, being able to interact with people and have those classes or certifications or whatever um, could be a really helpful way of creating technicians, advocates, um, people who are able to do maintenance on the various things that we're seeing. Um, and then, of course, there are other public benefits of which, you know, testing sites, vaccine distribution come to mind as the, the top things, but there are so many other more. Um, uh, but what I liked about um, the, the second presentation from Jan and Martin is that um, you all, um, you know, pushed back against this idea of standardization. And I think what we saw in um, uh, Jana's amazing photographs is that these gas stations have personality. Um, they've got different signs, they've got different uses, they've got different lighting. Um, and so those sites should reflect the personality and diversity of LA. And I think 
your approach um, was flexible to be able to do that. And uh, I think the, the most compelling concept in your presentation from my perspective was the public square or the roundabout park in the three and four leaf clovers. I think that's really cool. And you know, now thinking about it, it's like there are so many places in LA where there are those three or four gas stations. And so how can we reclaim that space as publicizing privately owned space um, instead of uh, privatizing publicly owned space? So um, lots of, of amazing ideas and uh, I, I'm really kind of interested in how do we take all of this forward? <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Julia. Let me turn to Professor Walensky Namias for your thoughts on, on these questions. And, and if you want to talk a little bit about the focus of your work and how it relates to some of these themes, you want to take a little bit of time to do that by way of introduction, please do. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for organizing that because I don't think I've had a chance to think about the future in quite a while. And so it's, it's a pretty nice opportunity to uh, um, get to think about, you know, um, how Los Angeles is really taking leadership in an area that's so important. So, you know, one of the things that I've learned just reading a little bit more about gas stations is that uh, the number of gas stations in the United States has decreased by about 50%, which is close to 100,000 in the last 20 years, and many of them are abandoned. And so in a way we're thinking forward about what we currently have as gas stations, but we still have some abandoned stations uh, that are out there that also require you know, some thinking and maybe can be integrated into this framework. Uh, I really liked in the first presentation, the connection that was made to uh, environmental health uh, as part of environmental justice. I, I think it's, generally important, but specifically important in the context of gas stations because they have these negative externalities to the community. And so we think a lot about how important a role they do play, and they obviously do, but there are also some negative externalities. And the question is, when we move away from what we have right now, how can we reduce these externalities and focus on the positive value that, can, that the community can receive? And, and I think one of the things that, that for me was uh, very attractive in both presentations, maybe especially in the second one, is the notion that we need to create a calming, calming effect in these communities, and especially in neighborhood gas stations. Um, many of them are in uh, less wealthy areas, and you, you see their you know, less tree canopy, and you see more gas stations that have crime in them or other kind of attract other negative uh, uh, elements. And so I think that this is a really important um, factor in thinking about safety, in thinking about calming effects for to reduce urban heat um, uh, for, for these communities. And the third element that I was mentioned actually earlier, I think by Michelle, was the issue of education. And that's something that I actually wanted to ask the presenters a little bit about. I think it's such an opportunity when you create a public space to add an element of kind of an education hub on um, solar energy, on electric energy, on you know generally sustainability. So I was wondering if if they could maybe um, a kind of relate to that uh, a little bit. The, the only other point that I, I wanted to make was that I, I thought the issue of variance was kind of the variety of different stations, uh, different locations. Um, there are also very different needs in the communities. And that connects a little bit to my work. I'm kind of interested in how communities can participate, how communities can engage. And I think one of the challenges for the city is probably to try to think creatively about bringing the community in, not at the stage where something is set and there is opposition, but at the stage of having people participate in the process. And I think that that would be um, uh, very important for uh, kind of a positive outcome. 
I, I agree entirely. And even, even for the purposes of this project, which we really see moving forward into 2021, thanks to the support of the sponsors, Electrify America, Audi, and others, um, we, we see the potential of a publication. And I think before that, though, is really engagement and really um, um, having conversations in communities about the variety of roles that these stations play in communities now and into the future. I think that's a a really significant set of points. So let me ask uh, Martin, Jan, or Jeffrey, if you want to uh, respond to some of those questions. Martin, go ahead. Yeah, I, I had uh, two thoughts, and, and, and thank you for, for the great response in this conversation. Uh, the first one that I, I think is interesting, and this is very an LA thing, is uh, we have an interesting relationship to public space. We actually rely heavily on spaces that feel public, but in the end are private. And I, I think even Jenna earlier said that she was asked to leave two shuttle stations, right? That says a lot about those spaces. So I, I think as we chart out this future, that, that is one thing we should consider. Um, the second one, I think, was, was, is to your, your uh, uh, Shana, your, your point about freeway adjacent gas stations. And, and quite frankly, many, many are close to the freeways. They're also the expensive ones we all know, so we try to avoid them. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, one thing we know about freeways is how detrimental they are to communities across Los Angeles, in particular communities of color. And what I find is that in LA, the freeway um, signals itself a few blocks away. Because as you approach a freeway on-ramp, the built environment gets more and more auto-oriented, right? You can kind of feel it coming because the number of curb cuts increases, the canopies increase, the drive-through windows increase, the signage increase, right? So I, I do think balancing kind of the needs that I think you really well described with this opportunity to reframe LA and, and, and also reclaim some of that, not as, you know, these are the last two blocks we're gonna have to give up on them because they're freeway adjacent. Hmm. Really good point. And if, yeah. I, if I could, if I could jump into a couple please. of things that um, I think relate to some of the some of the comments that were made. Uh, to the first thing, the the, the piece about education, uh, I couldn't agree more. And there's some really nice correlations in terms of what you know some of the things that that a microgrid can do uh, versus, and then also having using that as an opportunity to educate people. Mm -hmm. So things like water storage, things like energy storage. Um, you know, th those types of things, water filtration, right? Those are great education moments. Those also work on this kind of microgrid scale uh, where there's a lot of people who say, you know, if we're all building that infrastructure into our homes, what happens when we need to upgrade? Isn't that a little bit better at a slightly bigger scale? Uh, so that, that's one thing. Another thing that, that I want to point out is the incredible correlation between where these gas stations are, are, are located and where on our Los Angeles map, people are the most park needy, the, the ones that are farthest away from parks. They're almost in the same place. So the ability to start to address some of those needs of getting people within a 10 minute walk of a park, we have an incredible opportunity to do that. And then the third thing I wanna say is about remediation. If we look at housing, a lot of housing gets built with subterranean parking. If you're building subterranean parking, you're actually in effect starting to remediate the site. A lot of the work is already done for you. So there's a nice uh, correlation there. Yeah, excellent point. Um, let me bring Christina and Spencer into the conversation. I'm curious for general responses in, uh, to the presentations and questions for the teams, but, but I also have a specific question about um, the potential reaction of these gas station owners. To what extent do you think that they will be um, already planning perhaps a transition to charging? And we've seen that as, as Jonna mentioned in some gas stations around the city. Um, uh, do, we, do we think that a significant proportion will be interested in, in, in managing that transition or to Julia's point, maintaining their role as connected to mobility in some broad sense, and how many of them will be interested in a much more dramatic uh, transformation that may require remediation and other um, sort of more, more dramatic intervention. So let me start with you, Spencer. Yeah, no, thanks. It's an interesting proposition. Uh, I know uh, the photograph we saw of that one gas station earlier that had it. I think we know for a fact that, that Chevron is moving in this direction. Shell just acquired a company called Green Lots, which is in the EV charging space. So unsurprising, right, that they're looking towards the future. Um, I, I think back to the first presentation and this acknowledgement that there is a 
uh, social justice component, you know, to this transition, it, it isn't inconceivable, right? There, it's not, these aren't mutually, mutually exclusive. You can imagine a hybrid transition where some of these stations, uh, in fact, uh, are incentivized to install EV chargers and maintain some gas. Now, in terms of the remediation and how you get the infrastructure in for the electricity and while still maintaining the liquid fuel component, maybe easier said than done in some cases, but depending on the particular configuration, you could imagine that being the case. I, I will share a bit of data that we know from our drivers at Audi, not that that's representative of where things are going eventually, but 80 to 90% of the charging uh, occurs at home for our drivers. And, um, you know, of, of course, I mean, these are folks that, that have the ability to charge at home, and that's not the case as you get into a more urban dense environment where you need more public charging. But the point is that we can probably do with far fewer gas stations, right? So again, it's being strategic as you think about those 500 plus stations across LA, you know, which, which would you want to retain and in what kind of geographic distribution as you think about density, et cetera. Um, but to answer your question, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, these are business models that have to be disrupted in a, in a certain sense. And I think the city, in terms of its land use planning and all of that can, I mean, there can be incentives and disincentives, right? That collectively that ecosystem creates so that we have more walkable communities, we have more parks, but we still serve the mobility interests. Hmm. Thank you. Christina, do you have thoughts on those, those issues? Hi, oh, yes. I actually wanted to bring up how oh, this you're in your ties. Car now. Hello. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. I'm still on the multitasking here. But no problem. I, I will tell you what I find interesting about all of this is how, you know, we can really pull the data on the ends of, for example, how we use GIS data to go about even selecting sites and where they should be placed in the first place. Uh, I think it would be an interesting analysis to look at those vacant gas stations and determine, hey, maybe they are useful to look at the use case of putting in a charging station there or so forth. So we do that analysis on every one of our sites. We're actually looking currently in the LA area for a mega site location. And we are currently in the process of pulling all of that GIS data. We're looking at utilization rates for some of our other stations that are smaller in size in order to determine the best location for a mega site in the LA location. Uh, and even determining you know, the use case of, for example, putting in a park along with that possible station, uh, it's all really all tied together. Uh, but we do pull that data at multiple levels to choose the best locations for future sites. And can you give us a little bit a, a, a sense of the scale of that of that mega site, um, both in terms sure. of charging charging facilities and yes. just urban scale? Oh, definitely. So we're actually looking uh, in the downtown uh, LA area at multiple locations. We would like to be in Santa Monica for this mega site based on other usage data and our lack of charging in the Santa Monica area of LA. Uh, so we're looking for that. And when, when I say mega site, uh, we're looking at a site that could utilize at least 20 charging stations. So it would be 20 charging stations or larger. Uh, with these mega sites that might be to include none of these are built yet. Canopies, solar canopies. So I did want to call that out. Uh, mm -hmm. as well as, for example, you know, an educational center or uh, parks or areas for, you know, users to sit and make it multifunctional. Mm -hmm. uh, we even explored the opportunity of having food carts and so forth or uh, at these sites. And we are exploring that in the LA area as well. Terrific. Thank you. We have about five or 10 mm -hmm. minutes left in this session, and I want to spend that time asking all of you, this includes the um, architects and uh, the respondents, um, to consider the question of, of how to condense your advice to the city. How should we be thinking about approaching these sites, particularly in terms of uh, the approach that the outreach we might do to owners, how we might think about subsidies, how we might think about air rights, 
um, as was, uh, I think, raised in Jeffrey's uh, presentation. So just some final comments from each of you uh, with a focus on that, sort of how the city might be thinking about this from a strategic point of view. Um, Professor Walensky, Namias, I, I noticed your hand was up, so I'll let you go first. Thank you. Um, I just actually had a small comment about that. I think that as much as we're seeing variance in terms of the needs of neighborhoods and the wants of neighborhoods and the value of current gas stations in different parts of the city, um, there is also uh, probably room for a lot of variance in terms of subsidies. I was impressed by the exercise that the uh, second presentation, the Parkinson Whale uh, did in terms of, maybe I'll do something like that in my class, I think. But uh, I think that, you know, there is a, a lot of room for um, variance in terms of um, subsidies. Uh, we're already seeing, for instance, in neighborhoods that are growing in um, Koreatown, in East Hollywood, where gas stations, or in Santa Monica, as was mentioned, gas stations are being turned into new mixed-use uh, apartment buildings and uh, or complexes. And so a lot of that is just happening, I think, without any subsidies and will probably continue to happen. But I think where the needs are in the areas that, you know, are do not have the same tree canopy, do not have the same uh, financial or commercial capacity, uh, this is where the city should focus really on and try to figure out the ways to approach it uh, and kind of develop a few models that can serve um, different types of a, a future use uh, goals. Thank you. Meg, maybe I'll turn to you next. Yeah, I think um, you know when we when we looked at at the kind of overall or numbers, I mean, we actually I think we it was double the number of houses that um, Perkin and Perkinson Wills um, had in their in their uh, numbers. It, when you look at the sites in their actual and you look at them, you model them on their actual areas, and and I think um, you know considering the remediation costs and. You, I think you, you would need to run that financial um, structure, but essentially, uh, your California has an incredible history of uh, collective sustainable investment. Your your pension fund, um, I think it's Calpers, has has one of the most um, you know it's one of the largest pension funds in the U.S. and it's also one of the most uh, sustainable in its investment strategy. And I think you know, and you also have an incredible entrepreneurial culture that ha really has crowdfunding at its at its you know kind of its heart and so if you combine those two things i think if you can um you know some kind of um collective ownership sustainable investment model would be would be really um would would work really well thank you so much and let me turn to julia and sean on the city side for their responses to what we've heard and then i'll maybe i'll give the architects the final word go ahead julia sure so I see two main tensions with this. Um, one is that you know the design or the use of each gas station might be individual, but the financing you need to make this happen is going to be comprehensive. Um, and so uh, there's a tension between how proactive and how much you do from the beginning with a larger vision in sight versus how slow you might need to move as a result of these being public spaces and these feeling like parts of a, a community. So I would echo the approach that um, Yael mentioned with starting with a few and seeing how it goes. Um, so instead of trying to do all 550 at once, I think um, being able to start in a, a few areas uh, uh, and then uh, building up those muscles, those models um, would be a really interesting way of, of doing something sustainably and with that idea of collective ownership in mind. Mm, thank you, Shauna. Yeah, I'll jump on the collective ownership tip because I, I, I really agree and I, I like the idea um, of the entrepreneurship and, and also just I think what's what's often lacking in terms of public spaces within Los Angeles is stewardship like this, you know, this idea, I think there's an untapped access <laughs> to lots of local money um, that is about bettering our city for all Angelinos and I think you know, something along the lines of that and kind of producing 
outcomes that are in, you know, environmental justice in the open space and kind of giving back in that way. Um, I think that the examples that we looked at, like the most compelling are, you know, pr problematic in the sense that these are already existing very valuable land. Right. And, uh, and I've not seen a lot of success in, you know, of course we don't do, um, uh, uh, eminent domain here. Like we always learn about that in planning school and it ends up, we don't do it <laughs> in practice. It's a really bad idea, but this idea of the really valuable land and the types of uses that we would like to see, which of course do take a lot of time and are not, um, you know, they don't, they don't bring in a lot of money. So I think the funding and perhaps funding around environmental justice would be key. Um, you know, one idea is urban air mobility, knowing that there's probably a lot of un unseen money yet coming that direction. Like, you know, I was trying to think of like where, how could these sites also um, bring in money? Um, I, and then to the point about the like active uses and sort of like what you do with that time. Um, I think Christina had kind of raised something for me as someone who used to go to gas stations and now no longer does, I'll tell you, they are really weird to me now, like really strange to go there. Um, they, I, I'm just like so not used to it, but what I, what I do like about charging stations, and I think what I would look for as we continue to produce those, are ones that do have many chargers, um, a place that feels kind of safe and like there's more people. I tend to, as I'm charging, if it's just you, you're kind of in a random neighborhood, you've never been there, you're not sure if the charger works, like this idea of kind of um, stations that are super reliable and there's something to do, because technically you're supposed to get out of your car, so you're not supposed to sit in there. Um, if you can shop, if you can go for a walk, if you can engage in some way, that to me always feels like it's less of a hassle. Um, and I've actually appreciated the opportunity. I only have 90 miles on my car, so that does mean I stop a lot. Um, and I've been in a lot of random places um, because of that. And, and once you kind of can also use that opportunity to either get an errand done or explore a place that you wouldn't have thought of, it's not so troubling, so. Mm -hmm. uh, Terrific. Um, and let me give the last word to the architects for just quick closing thoughts. And we'll start with Martin and Jan and then, and then uh, hand it over to Jeffrey. Um, well, I, first of all, uh, thanks, Meg, for the note. We'll adjust our slide. I, I also, I think just to kind of sum it up, uh, I think what we need is a campaign. I mean, we need to capture the public imagination and really get people to imagine the possibility, just the same way that the automotive industry did. Uh, back in the 50s. And, and, and then I think things get easier from them. It becomes from there, it becomes something that everyone wants. And so, uh, Yael, that kind of strategy of, you know, starting small, I mean, maybe there is this kind of little mini world fair, this place, this expo where people can go and experience what happens to a block when you transform it in this way. And, you know, I mean, obviously, if you ask us to be a I need to be unrealistic, I want apiaries and urban farms on all 550 sites. Um, but if, if you did ask me to be a little more realistic, I do think um, inventory, considering sites for their context, ownership, uh, community, uh, environmental remediation need, I think you can really start a strategy. And, and then I think really looking into the bag of tricks, uh, uh, in particular thinking of what New York did with their theaters, transfer of uh, development rights, and uh, and saying well maybe there's even an avenue of 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 you know relocating the development rights kicking in some for uh for the for the remediation and then turning it into public facility ownership right um uh, obviously not for all sites uh but uh really thinking about that in a targeted manner uh but also early because i do think i mean i think the one takeaway from this is it's already happening right we've already lost ten thousand of them, uh, 10,000 opportunities to do something great on. So um, uh, let's, let's get right on it. I agree. I think this question of inventory and community engagement really have to be the next two steps to really understand uh, what we have, where they're located, the ownership, the kind of potential value or potential pressures um, as, as the uses may be transformed will be really important information understanding for the city to have going forward. Jeffrey. Um, I'm always amazed by uh, the pilot test for the dedicated bike lanes in New York City. Um, they wanted it to be in a place that would have high presence. Um, so they tried um, Times Square. And it actually was hugely successful. It didn't decrease um, uh, traffic 
uh, it didn't increase um, pedestrian injury. It didn't um, increase traffic jams. It was actually hugely successful. And it seems like it would be great for a pilot program to test alternative uses for gas stations, um, that it is in a high profile place that people can see and see its success. And that I would just say that it's in the best interest, especially of um, gas station owners who have one, two, or three stations to try something because they know that they're not going to necessarily be able to get the support of a, a shell or mobile and what they do. Um, and so the idea that more traffic to a gas station site in its hybrid use is in their greatest interest. So um, trying to align with um, the small gas station owners um, would be a great way to start a pilot um, program. And then lastly, totally agree that if LA is the, the place that produces culture about mobility through media and other means, it seems like the very place in which um, some kind of um, campaign to think about what the culture of mobility will be in the future needs to start here and could very well start with the gas station. Mm. Well said, thank you, Jeffrey. And um, Yael points out in the chat, I'm not sure if she says if gas stations can be counted as brownfields, but from what I hear, um, federal funding, of course, may be back in a significant way. Um, so of course, the transition at the federal level, there's significant implications or perhaps, perhaps opportunities. I wanna say in closing, it's been great to see the hills behind your shoulder there, Jeffrey, and also Christina in her car to kind of fitting backdrops for this conversation um, to locate it here in Los Angeles and located in, in uh, questions of, of, of mobility and that culture of mobility as uh, so many of you have talked about. So let me thank first the architects for their presentations and then thank all of the respondents for a really terrific discussion, um, given us a lot to think about and I think really clarified for us what the next step should be in terms of thinking about a a kind of comprehensive strategy that really has to be responsive to a diversity of sites and community needs across across the city. So we will take a, a break until 4.30. We'll give you all a chance to stretch your legs. We'll be back uh, at 4.30 to talk um, about the design of charging depots for an electric trucking fleet with a presentation from uh, Moss Architects, which I'm really looking forward to seeing. And during this break, we will see the color batch of photographs of gas stations in Los Angeles uh, from Jana, Ireland. So thanks again to all the participants in this session.
Welcome back, everyone. Hello again, I'm Christopher Hawthorne. Uh, this is the third session of Pump to Plug. I welcome the audience members who have stuck with us, a remarkable number of you who have, who have stuck with us across the entire afternoon. I'd like to welcome anyone who's just joining us. We'll be looking in, in this session at the design of charging depots for an electric trucking fleet, looking in particular at sites near the port of Los Angeles. And I'm, I'm really excited to say that we have um, the hugely talented firm Moss Architects to make a presentation slash provocation about um, thinking about the future of these sites and the design, architecture, and, and, and urbanism of these depots. So we'll hear a presentation uh, from Hillary Sample and Michael Meredith of Moss Architects. We will reconvene for a discussion uh, with a couple of new respondents and, I, and some familiar faces uh, for those of you who have been with us throughout. And when we reconvene after the presentation, I will um, go through those respondents as we move into a discussion. This session is slightly shorter than the others. We just have a single presentation. Uh, so we will hope to wrap up by 5.30 or so. And again, I wanna thank um, everyone uh, who has made a presentation, all the respondents for a really terrific discussion so far. And this is one of the presentations I've really, uh, really been looking forward to. So I will hand it over to Hillary and Michael with our gratitude for joining us this afternoon. And hi, Christopher. Thank you so much for inviting us. We're so happy to be here tonight. It's been great to watch all the presentations and see um, the proposals and, and thinking. I think we're along the lines of uh, some of the things already presented. Um, it's interesting. I, as, as Jan was talking about the kind of design expo, I, I started thinking a little bit about uh, here in New York City in the early 1980s, the city used to run these things called Big Apple Fix-Up, and they were um, open to the public and people would come in and ask questions about um, a range of things about housing, um, from finance to literally how to fix up their own homes. And um, so that just started some, some wheels spinning about thinking about what, what could be done with respect to, to this. Um, I um, wanted to start by, um, I, I don't see our presentation, I don't know if it's possible to great show it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just, I'll just ask to move the slide forward when, uh, when we're ready. But I just um, wanted to present by, so, so we uh, were interested to look at the electric truck um, and the electric truck truck charging uh, depot. Uh, and so if you could just go to the next slide. I think as we started to think about um, the importance of trucks and um, how we rely on trucks so much, uh, the conversation is always seems to be more around cars than it is around trucks. Trucks almost um, and, and drivers seem to be uh, what keeps part of our society going and yet maybe treated more um, almost invisibly, even though they're a much larger presence um, in uh, the kind of uh, culture and, and physical presence on, on highways. So this was something really uh, interesting to us to start to look at. And we started to think a little bit about um, how, uh, what would the approach be like? Um, and thinking around a title that we called Stitching the City Together. Um, so this text, which you can read, I, I'm just gonna read, read it quickly, but our highways are increasingly ineffective and costly. Defunct rest stops, gas stations, parking lots, on and off ramps remain leftovers of progress, each component specifically engineered for a single purpose. As driving changes, the specificity ensures obsolescence. This occurrence is particularly relevant to LA, which constructed an image and romance around highways, traffic, and coal culture and whose roadways came at a cost. Low income neighborhoods cleared in the name of progress, dividing the city, further reinforcing racial divisions and economic inequalities. Public space superseded with infrastructure whose destructive conditions persist. Asphalt leaches into the ground and exhaust contaminates the air. What if we could reduce and adapt existing highway infrastructure into linear parks, weaving throughout, stitching the city together? What if we thought of three lanes becoming two or maybe even one? I know that seems kind of extreme for LA, but existing uh, rest stops become charging stations 
and an island of public parks. A city defined by a lack of public parks and an excess of cars transforms into a greater diversity of common spaces, parks, neighborhoods, interconnected all together. Um, so I think if we go to the next slide, we're not so much proposing a design proposal here, but rather setting up um, kind of a set of thoughts uh, and prompting a conversation, I think in this case, extending a conversation from the previous uh, projects. Um, so we think about shifts in energy and remote working. Uh, certainly we're in that moment now with respect to remote working. Uh, we'll produce a situation where trucking will eventually become the dominant user of road infrastructure or could we think about that? What if that is a possibility? Things seem like they will become more extreme between operating more locally and more distantly simultaneously. If we think locally, pedestrian cycling will go up um, and then longer travel and shipping will go up um, also. Commuting to work will go down. Uh, some of this was thinking a little bit about um, ideas and things we had been reading sort of pre-pandemic, but uh, it, it, if we were uh, looking at, let's say in 2018, there was an article in the Washington Post, which we were really struck by, that started to speculate um, the end of the city. Americans say that there's not much appeal to big city living. Why do so many of us live there? Um, and reported in this study that, that people were actually saying they wanted to live in rural areas more. This was sort of one idea that has sort of stuck in our mind. Like, is this, is this really true? What, what, is, what does that mean for cities then, for sure? Um, we speculate something a little different, that most people want the best of everything, to live in dense, vibrant, diverse cities with cultural amenities and access to outdoor space, and, in this case, instead of or. As such, our infrastructure needs to change, and, and then what does this mean for trucking? Trucking infrastructure needs to grow to allow for greater use, both by trucks, truck drivers, and a general public, more common spaces that are open and adaptable. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, oh, I guess so, sorry, I skipped one here, but the previous one, the truck highway volume. Um, in 2020, more than 8,500 trucks a day travel along roads indicated in red. In 2018, the average combination truck, commonly known as tractor trailer, drove 63,374 miles annually, nearly twice the amount than in 1970, which was at 38,822 miles. So between 1970 and 2018, the number of combination trucks grew 300%, nearly 3 million in 2018, compared to 1 million in 1970. Um, so in this image here, vehicles miles per gallon. After the first fuel crisis, fuel crisis in the early 1970s, U.S. consumers began to demand more fuel efficient vehicles. Yet truck fuel efficiency did not improve and has not increased over the past 60 years, partially due to increased size and loads over time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as has been mentioned already, um, number of parks, Los Angeles has 644 parks. This is roughly a quarter of New York City's parks and half of Chicago's. Um, we've also been sort of looking at the same uh, references, but New York has 2,314 parks and Chicago has 1,232 parks. Um, so you can just see the kind of comparison uh, to that. Uh, next slide. Um, Percentage of parkland, only 12% of Los Angeles city uh, land is used for parks and recreation, so quite low, um, whereas 24% is used in Washington, D.C., 21% in New York, and 21% in San Francisco. Next slide. Um, this, in this case, 10-minute walking distance. Uh, so again, some of this is repeating from previous projects, but 60% of Angelinos live within a 10-minute walking distance of public parkland. And what we see in Washington, D.C. and Chicago, this was 98% in New York, 99%, and 100% in San Francisco. Next slide. So the context, um, with this in mind, then we started to turn um, to the city itself, and if the prompt was to look along 710 Highway, um, we started to look um, more closely towards what has already become just a very heavy industrialized and almost seemingly um, uh, kind of wasteland um, just 
no green <laughs> whatsoever uh, could we see uh, from looking at maps. Um, and in this case, the context of looking at the twin ports um, surrounded on three sides by industrial and then further out working class neighborhoods um, and west of downtown Long Beach. Um, in the kind of surrounding neighborhoods, we seem to understand that the median household income ranges, varies from 40,000 to 58,000. Um, the U.S. median household income is around $68,000. Uh, that's taken from 2019. Uh, next slide, please. So as we looked along the 710 corridor um, with respect to trucks in particular, 40% of all goods coming into the U.S. enter through the twin ports. Um, 36,000 truck trips occur daily on the I-710. Um, and what we saw was that it, this is expected to rise by 50% by 2035, up to 54,000 trucks per day. Um, so we started looking at some of the kind of black dots um, on that map. Um, we looked at a few different sites um, and tried to really just look for land that was open, that seemed to be public, um, or already had some relationship to uh, city amenities. I think one of these sites had to do with a kind of fire station, um, and the site around it was really empty. Um, so this isn't, we're not necessarily advocating for this as a specific site to develop, but rather what could you start to do in those sites that seem to be, um, seem to be empty um, or not, not used. Next slide, please. Um, so here we started to look at a site which is about four miles nor north of the Twin, uh, twin Ports, um, located between two uh, four, four leaf clovers for the clover turnarounds, uh, two bridges and along the river, um, and seemed to be a, a kind of uh, unused site or perhaps just for, for storage of something, some gravel or something like this. Uh, and then what's immediately to the left uh, are more resident, sorry, not residential, but uh, warehouse uh, things that are in support of highway infrastructure. Um, so some of, there are some gas stations along this um, and some other kinds of uh, just heavy duty uh, industrial uh, repair sites. Um, so something that was also not, um, dealing directly with residential um, and challenging uh, that, uh, but rather just a, a space that seemed like it could be potentially greened um, and also obviously along that line for trucks. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, and in this case, this looks at the existing uh, parks. So we can see uh, it's quite far uh, to any other adjacent park. Next slide, please. And so we made a kind of squiggle drawing here uh, and uh, trying to think a little bit about this idea of how you could start to connect through public infrastructure. And so it's really just a suggestion um, about how to try to link these, these spaces through a network of, of green. Um, next slide. Uh, gas station. So as we've seen in the previous presentations, the uh, architecture of gas station as a symbol of progress. California will require all passenger vehicles and heavy duty trucks to be zero emission by 2035. A shift towards energy efficiency for these vehicles will affect our understanding of gas stations and introducing of, or sorry, introduction of charging um, means time. Next slide. Whereas the rest stop made for a single purpose with little diversity of use, engineered typology, which makes our proposal easier to be repeated as an urban typology, or at least something to, to question. Um, and in this case, also thinking a little bit about um, creating a new type um, with the hopes that it could undo some of the damage that the car, truck, highway has done urbanistically. So how to um, how to think about it becoming more integrated um, into its surroundings. Next slide. Uh, but what are some of the demands that then are placed into this as a, a kind of activation for that? Hours of service regulation. Um, so there's a, a federal maximum 11 cumulative hours of driving in a 14 hour period. Um, so I'm just gonna sort of run through this list um, here that we um, we're referencing federal mandatory 30 minute break during the first eight hours of driving, federal minimum 10 consecutive hours of rest after driving period, 
typical at port. Drivers make as many as 50 to 80 mile trips as they can in a day. And typical at port, average um, drayage dry, truck driver will make two trips per shift. Trucks can go for two shifts a day with two different drivers and a break in between for charging three to four hours. I think one of the things we're interested in also is just the daily life of the truck driver um, and what's available to, to him or to her um, in these um, moments of pause and, and when are those given, what is their life like? Um, so this proposal imagine is, imagines a mix of short and long haul drivers. Next slide. Uh, and so here, um, to reduce and adapt existing highway infrastructure, lanes and rest stops, rest stops into an island of electric charging stations and public parks. Um, here we're just showing a kind of combination of um, uh, trucks pulling in, uh, things like uh, restrooms, potential storage, elevators uh, going to a second floor. Um, uh, next slide. And next slide. And then offering up some speculation on what could be some of the other amenities uh, that would support the drivers in their um, moments of, of pause and rest um, while the truck is being recharged. And then also trying to think about who else might be able to come and share in the space. So things like uh, spaces for market, um, health clinic. I think one thing that's also really important and interesting is how to um, talk about the life, the sort of daily life of the truck driver and trucking in general. Um, so uh, things like clinics that can help to uh, monitor truck drivers' health, uh, but also things that would relate to, let's say maybe even exhibition or gallery to talk about, um, uh, in this case, potentially education around um, trucking and, and um, occupational, things, even occupational hazards. I think there's a, a kind of great possibility that could be rethought here um, through uh, the program. Next slide. Uh, and then the roof, um, yet to be determined, but that is also a potential space. I, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about the life of the truck driver and being up high, um, you know, that they really do sort of survey the land and they see uh, the road, the land, other cars, people, and cities um, from a different, a different level. And so this relationship to ground also changes uh, with the driver and then perhaps with the building. Um, could also be used for solar panels. I'm not sure yet, but we're something we're thinking about. Next slide. Uh, and then just some, uh, again, a kind of further uh, sketching uh, ideas uh, for what, what that might look like um, and over the course of the day. So a kind of afternoon um, uh, image um, and then sort of putting it in context with a park. The idea that, you know, you could also drive and park your car and walk across the green um, to that space. Um, next slide. And then at nighttime, um, also looking at, you know, just the, the kind of day, sort of day in the life of, of the project. So that's really it. It's a kind of fast, sort of fast sketch um, for our, our presentation. Michael, if you want to add anything. Thank you. Michael, please go ahead if you'd like to add any thoughts before we get to the group. I think she said it all. I, the, the thing is it's too, it's uh, maybe two levels or two sided. So one side for the, the truck um, and then yeah. the other side is more for uh, a part out of the park system, kind of part of this archipelago of parks that are tied together. Um, and then the building can mediate between the two. So it can provide for public, public amenities, but also truck specific amenities, let's say. It's like Hillary said, it's kind of a diagrammatic thought at the beginning, trying to really mm -hmm. ground ourselves in the situation. No, it's super helpful, the approach that you've taken. And um, let me let me introduce the respondents for, for this discussion. Um, uh, Michelle Kinman, Director of Transportation for the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Lacey is back with us. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Geraldine Natz, Professor of the Practice of Policy and Engineering at USC and the former Director of the Port of Los Angeles. Thank you so much for being with us. Matt Peterson, President and CEO of Lacey is back. 
as well as is Spencer Reeder, Director of Government Affairs and Sustainability at Audi of America, um, and my colleague in the mayor's office, Michael Samuelon, who heads up electric vehicle efforts in the sustainability office um, of the mayor. Let me, before we turn to the, the panel, let me ask you, um, Michael and Hillary, just for whether there was anything that really struck you or surprised you um, in looking at this from, from across the country, looking at, at Los Angeles, which again, as we've talked about all afternoon, is so closely connected in the public imagination with mobility, with this architectures and infrastructures of mobility, um, but which is seeing those sort of emblems of that car culture either transforming or challenged or fading away to one degree or another. Um, just curious what struck you or perhaps surprised you as you began to dig into the question of this relationship of charging depots, the port and goods distribution, et cetera. I think, I mean, I'll speak personally. Hillary may have different, different um, observations in a way, but you know, I think when we look at the data, I was, we were really shocked at, at the park space. I mean, we all know LA is all, is like kind of car centric. I mean, it's, especially in architecture, it's a kind of constant drum that is, that is beat. Um, but you know, there's also the other side of LA too, and at least from a New Yorker's point of view is, is like kind of fitness, health, lifestyle. And, and, I was just assuming there was a lot more access to outdoor spaces, honestly, for people. And so it was kind of shocking to see how little there is. And, and, and also, uh, who is it accessible for? So. Yeah, I think that's good. I, I, um, I guess I, on a more personal note, I grew up near Mack Trucks in Pennsylvania. And so I, I really feel like, um, you know, that importance of the culture around trucking, um, you know, is something that is not, um, it's very visible to me. I feel like I notice <laughs> trucks a lot on the highway and, um, you know, the life of the CB radio and, you know, I think all of that too has its own kind of cult. Um, maybe it's less celebrated in, in, um, popular culture you know it's a more of a sub subculture somehow um but really trying to understand um the, the life and and does changing uh, fuel change the life of of the driver and of of the industry for sure it does in some ways but um at what scale and then as an architect how do we um start to engage in that. And I, I think for us, we were really interested in, you know, that this sets up uh, a conversation across so many different disciplines, um, where the station somehow to me feels more under the purview still of the architect. Um, but this really is an opportunity to engage across all different um, uh, practices. And, uh, you know, I, I study and work a lot on uh, affordable housing, and I'm, I've been really interested lately in uh, is issues around sound and noise. And so, you know, to what degree does this change that? And we've seen so much policy, you know, the, the Noise Control Act from 72 really sets up a furthering of divisions um, in cities to sub suburbs and, um, you know, further exas exacerbates um, poor health in uh, cities, uh, city mm -hmm. housing. Anyway, so I, no, those are really important points, and 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 as is your point about the the lack of green space, of course. And the flip side of that is that, for much of the 20th century, there was a kind of expectation that even for middle class or even for parts of the 20th century, working class Angelinos could expect some outdoor space connected to their residential space, um, particularly if they were renting or owning a home, a single family home. Um, and so, because of the um, success of that sort of particular Angelino version of the American dream, instead of building one central park here, we essentially built tens of thousands of miniature privatized central parks that we distributed all across the region. And of course, that dream began to break down for most um, um, aspiring home buyers um, by the 1980s. And of course, it was always compromised in, in really profound ways by um, redlining, by exclusionary lending practices, et cetera. So, the dream itself had had a, a lot of myth at the center of it, but um, it is at the center of this question because one of the fundamental challenges we face in Los Angeles is to build a constituency for those open spaces that are 
that are private, that are publicly owned and managed. Um, but also recognizing, as some of the other presenters have pointed out, the really great reservoir of, of uh, privately owned or operated space that sort of acts in a quasi-public manner in Los Angeles in ways that don't always apply uh, in other cities. So that, that those questions are all part of the equation here. Um, let me turn next to Geraldine, um, who obviously brings great expertise uh, in the port and its operations and the connections to the 710 corridor. And before I do that, I just also want to thank um, uh, you in the presentation um, for really clarifying the ways in which we don't always um, make these operations visible. Um, I think, Hillary, the way that you um, have both articulated that, the, that, that distribution of goods through the 710 corridor, its environmental impacts, its, its urban impacts, et cetera, infrastructural implications across the whole American Southwest are really uh, is not something that has been at the center of how we have understood Los Angeles, particularly in the kind of civic identity that we have broadcast out to the rest of the world. But of course, it's fundamentally important to the way that this city operates. Geraldine, as you know well. So let me ask you for some responses and some questions if you have them for um, for the architect. Hey, I, uh, I want to make a few comments on, on like two topics. I do want to mention the green space issue because um, there are there is a lot of green spaces within the port of Los Angeles. You know, there's a 16 mile waterfront that's being developed, the LA waterfront, but it's an area that's segregated from the more heavy container terminal facilities. And and obviously, um, Hillary, you know, you're right on in terms of it's got to be long, it's got to be linear, it's got to have easy access in and out. Um, and you know, when I was first, well, I'll, I'll tell you this little story. When I was port director, um, there's this TV show, Undercover Boss. And so they came to the port and they wanted me to go undercover. So I said, okay, I want to be a trucker, you know, and, and so as it turned out, it never happened because I couldn't pee in a jar in the cab of a truck. And so Terminal Island has no restrooms. And that's where the core of um, the container business is. And so when the, you know, I read the proposal, I have to tell you, there's a piece of property that just bounced right into my head as, oh, this is where it should go. Um, and 710 would be great, except I don't know there's a plan to widen the 710. And so that property may already be, you know, maybe someone else can speak to that, you know, in, you know got plans for it. But right in the center of Terminal Island, there's the old Navy commissary area. It's right, right at the city boundaries. It's right where the transportation corridor comes off of the ports. And um, I used to like covet that property. I was like, oh my God, restrooms, truck stop, in and out burger, charging stations. It, you know, to me, that's a spot that just, you know, popped into my head. Truckers definitely need amenities down there. They've got some services along Anaheim and along PCH, but it's, you know, they're kind of the link in our logistic chain that don't get the attention that they really should. And Geraldine, thank you for that. Can you talk a little bit about the histories of electrification um, uh, plans at the port during your time there and, and as they've accelerated um, more, more recently and some of the challenges that have been inherent to, to that planning effort? Well, during my time, the focus was getting rid of the old dirty diesel trucks um, because it, the harbor was where long haul trucks came to die. And so we imposed the truck bans and initially it was, you know, we had to have a 2007 model truck and then a 2010 model. The latest iteration of the plan requires um, zero emission trucks or near zero emission trucks. And we drove that turnover in trucks with a fee that was put in place. And so now the plan is by 20, uh, 2035, 2035, all of the trucks serving the ports have to be zero emission. So you're talking about a huge volume of, you know, it'll come in over time, um, but there's going to be a huge need for um, charging. And so in my view, it's probably going to have to be a combination of things. 
Some of the big warehousing districts out like in Carson might have car uh, charging stations. There may be some stations inside port terminals because sometimes a trucker will get stuck in there for hours. So it's gonna be a combination of things, I think that'll be needed. No, and I'm thinking at the uh, back to the comments in the earlier sessions about the amount of charging for electric passenger vehicles that happens at home. And there's an equivalent is what you're saying here that that won't be out on the road. It will be before they leave the port. A lot of that yeah. charging will happen within that larger facility. Um, let me ask. Can't take those trucks home because <laughs> the street, the residential areas have those big signs banning you know trucks. You can't park in the residential areas, so they have to be left someplace at night. And that's an opportunity for charging stations. Right, right. It's a much more circumscribed kind of mobility than is the case, yeah. obviously, for passenger yeah. vehicles. It's, in, it's very interesting because in a kind of rural setting, people do take their trucks home. And so this really is a, a very interesting question just about shift in, in neighborhoods and context. But I think we were, I mean, the proposal... Um, it's not really totally a proposal, but you know, interested in the kind of prototypes. So it's a sort of prototypical, and you know, how could it adapt in different locations? It's really interesting mm -hmm. for us to and, think about. Um, Matt and Michelle, I know that you at Lacey have been thinking about these questions. Um, so curious, Matt, for your thoughts, um, responses to the presentation, or questions for the team. Yeah, I'm on the study, it, it was I thought. Uh, very thoughtful and, and comprehensive and and um, you know it's uh, it's always good to have a view from another place into the something that we're all some of us those that pay attention to these issues and have looked at them are, are familiar with um, uh, you know I think uh, the the nature of the charging needs uh, for drag, the dredge trucks is that you, you really need, you know, we're going to need fast charging in and around the ports or where they go to. So that means, you know, um, whether it's the site that the team picked, uh, uh, um, uh, which, you know, we've looked at some sites and done assessments, but do they have enough electrical power? Are they adjacent to enough electrical power? Are they, um, uh, is it operationally feasible to get big rig trucks in and out of their class A trucks? Is it, uh, uh, are they well, position to you know the sites uh, to, to be able to even be used user friendly um, uh, um, or out in the warehouse and the other warehouses in the Inland, Inland Empire the other place where uh, there's going to be fast charging needed um, otherwise you know they're going to need to charge at home or near home if they own the truck and drive it home um, which is you know a challenge as we just identified um, so we you know there's there's so much involved in the amount of electricity required for these fast chargers is is, is quite significant um so the cost and planning and then a lot of these sites are contaminated um so you've got to do some cleanup that that are in around the port so it's it's, it's so similar to the gas station uh challenge um in some ways so it's it's not simple um and it takes 18 months at least to, from even when you selected a site and determined it's it's viable um to getting the charging installed so I, I, you know, the, the dimensionality of this one is, it's, it's more complex than light duty charging for sure, but I appreciated very much the team's uh, view and, and then the study they did um, to, to, and the site they selected and the, the issues they brought up. Michelle. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Christopher, for having this session as part of Pump to Plug and Hillary and Michael for taking it on. Um, you know, just, while this is very much an LA focused exercise today, I think it's important to note, as you alluded to Hillary, that this is really something that we're gonna be tackling you know, across the country, across the state. And I wanna give a quick shout out to Jesse Denver, who's with East Bay Community Energy up in Northern California and Alameda County, one of our partners with whom we're working on this very question of how do we quickly electrify, not only here in Southern California, but Northern California as well. So, the insights from today will, will live on beyond the LA region. Um, to piggyback on something that Geraldine said, she was talking about the ambitious goals that we have for our region. And I think it's important to stop for a moment and realize that even today, we have 36,000 plus trucks traveling on the 710 every single day. And that's a, a staggering amount of trucks and that number is only going to grow over time. And so that really underlies the importance of having these publicly accessible charging sites for trucks. Of course, there are going to be larger fleets that have their own private sites, but we're gonna need these public sites. And so I think it's really commendable how you've worked in green space, not only for the benefit of the truckers themselves to enjoy, 
but also for the surrounding communities. You are absolutely right. Those satellite maps are not lying to you. There is a real dearth of, of green space in these areas. And the only other thing that I would add that I really liked that I saw in your drawing was just the amount of space you've allotted for the trucks to come in to the charging spaces. We've heard directly from a number of uh, fleets already that that's just really important, particularly in terms of a public site where there are you know, gonna be drivers who are trained by a number of different companies coming in and out of that site. So that's really important to maintain. So nice work, thank you. A related question on that, um, what about exit? I was curious about how the necessity of backing out versus pull through, drive through, um, and, and the kind of uh, logistics um, and site planning that are related to that. So that's a question for the architects or for those who can tell us about the layout of these, um, we can, these charging depots. We looked at both. Uh, we started looking at drive through, but it really became evident it, it uh, affected the the park space and the public side let's say so it just just became really difficult to to navigate the two it seemed it at the beginning we actually did have everybody driving through um and then once we f fixed on the parks as a kind of problem that we also attached to the truck uh charging station uh park pulling out seemed easier and also the building got to be smaller it was much bigger with all the amenities in it and wider and then it became smaller for we were trying to do all the we try i mean we're not engineers but we did, looked at all the turning radiuses and we looked at the issues of the cabs that have come up already in damage and mm -hmm. and so we made it really long we made a building that was kind of narrow almost like a retaining wall to some degree and and just for the covering the cabs and then allowing for circulation and other things. We also just love these weird urban types. We were looking at things like just these, these things that exist like rest stops. You know, architects don't really think about them that much. I mean, I think gas stations get a lot more glamorous attention. And, you know, there, there's a lot of things that are just taken for granted that really define our cities. We were, I, I don't know, we got, I got obsessed with mini storage at one point anyways, but like, you know, it's like all these weird building types that, that, that exist that we have to deal with as a, as a society and architects don't usually look at them. And as a result, I was really struck also just by the oval and um, incorporating both this long narrow program for the uh for the truckers but also the park space it almost begins to look like a racetrack with a grandstand you begin yeah, to see a little bit. of other building types yeah. um but a, a question uh back to um matt and michelle just a question as we and then i'll get to you michael um uh, all right as we as we look ahead to this deadline of 2035 you know something we talked about earlier today was um, how quickly this uh, transition will happen in certain sectors of the economy or certain communities and how others will really be working right up to that deadline of 2035, whether they're gas station owners or, um, or drivers. Um, what's your sense about the pace of this uh, transition in and around the port and whether it's, rather, whether it's more likely to happen sort of in the first half of that, um, those remaining years or, or toward the end? What's your sense about that? I think we absolutely need to start today. There are already electric drainage trucks on the road and more that will be commercially available very soon. And the onus is really on the charging infrastructure side. And as Matt alluded to earlier, it can take quite a spell to get through the, the process to get permitted and to get those charging infrastructure stations connected to the electricity grid. And so we absolutely need to start and do that now, which is why this is such a fantastic conversation. Our goal at Lacey and with the Transportation Electrification Partnership is for us to have 40% of those drainage trucks on the road, zero emissions by 2028, so that we ensure we don't wait until the last minute to make this transition or we're setting ourselves up for failure. But just to clarify, your sense is really that the lack of uh, charging infrastructure for these vehicles is holding back the transition at this point to a certain degree? Yes. Um, okay, Sam Alum, you're up. 
Thanks, Christopher. I would definitely uh, double down on what Michelle said. We, I, I feel very confident that infrastructure is what's holding us back right now, um, or the, the main thing holding us back. Cost, of course, is a huge one. But um, I wanted to point out a couple of operational items for um, Hillary and Michael to keep in mind um, if there's any further refinement of the concept here. But um, the operational efforts that, uh, or, the, or the ops, basically, of dredge trucking and trucking generally are very distinct from almost all other uses. Commercial um, commercial truck use is to the greatest extent possible. You want that piece of equipment in use at all times. The human is an unfortunate side piece to that. And the truck moving things from one place to another is really what you're trying to do um, if you're a trucking company. And that's sort of, um, I'll put my Bernie Sanders hat on. That's just the problem of capitalism. It is what it is. So we need to keep these things moving at all times. Um, and what that means is uh, duty cycle wise, you have a lot of times uh, slip seating where you'll have two shifts basically in a row. This is, and you guys alluded to some of the, some of this with the 14 hour days and things like that, but um, you'll have these trucks going as long as possible, which means you need your chargers to be um, very high powered and you're going to need them really, at least in the LA context or in the <clears throat> regional context here for Dre, you're going to need, need a bunch in and around um, the port and then it, uh, a bunch in and around the inland ports, wherever the, wherever the containers are going. And just to sort of put things in perspective um, for the nerds on the call or still around today, um, if you've got a truck that can do 250 miles of range, it probably has about a 500 megawatt um, hour battery, thereabouts. So um, thinking about how much power is needed to do a 30 minute charge of that or a 40 minute charge of that, which by the way, that's the only, that's as much time as they want to stop. If these guys are stopped, they're not making money, they're off the clock or they're, they're on the clock, they're on their lunch break and that's it. And so from an operational standpoint, you really need to think about Green space is, is great, it's important, but for these guys in the commercial world, um, the the literal walk in the park that we're talking about here is, that's nice, but what matters most is getting in and out quickly. Um, and then something else to think about for sort of five or 10 years from now, um, platooning. So this is a really important uh, way of doing trucking that um, a lot of OEMs are thinking about and that, you know, for efficiency sake, people are looking at this as, where you will have, you know, two or three trucks basically connected through autonomous technologies going, moving together. It's kind of like a train, except it's three trucks. Um, and whether that ends up with just one driver or three drivers, I think is to be determined. And really it probably won't be a driver, but it'll be, you know, someone in there sort of just making sure nothing goes crazy. Um, but operationally speaking, <clears throat> what does that mean when you have these trucks coming in two, three, four at a time because they're platooning. Um, so just just some more thoughts to layer on top of the problem. The platooning seems like an interesting problem. I, I mean, we were thinking about autonomous trucking in the long term. It seems like more of a reason to have, I mean, the park isn't necessarily for the truckers to just, um, uh, just hang out in some socialist. I don't know what, where you're going exactly with it, but <laughs> like, it, but um, fantasy, but they, but you know, it's really for also the, the communities that really have been affected by the highway. So, I, yeah, I have some questions about that and the and in relationship to air quality. But before we get to that, I just wanted to see if there are other thoughts from either Spencer or Geraldine, others who want to jump in on the on the themes that we've touched would, on so far. I'd like to, you know, echo Michael's comments. I think he was really right on. You have to recognize the truckers have a lot of waiting time just in affecting their move into the port and out. So they may be waiting, you know, in the terminal. And so, you know, there's sometimes that's time for them to maybe, you know, eat their lunch while they're sitting in the cab or whatever. And they get paid by the load. They don't get paid by hour. So they want to get in and get out. And yeah, they're not going to be doing a little hike or, or those kinds of things. I did, uh, although I do have to say the idea of having a place for a health check-in, if somebody's sick, like an urgent care, I, I can see a value for that in the port. But um, I thought Michael's comments were um, very, you know, spot on. Um, 
I mean, short of a, this is Spencer from Audi, short of a product announcement that would shock the world. Yeah, Audi doesn't really have a direct <laughs> in, um, yes. in the trucking, but we, we are part of the Volkswagen group, which does have Scania and MAN in Europe. And we just did acquire Navistar here in the US. So, so uh, in terms of the larger group, this is a, an issue. I, I just would take, um, I guess, the opportunity to, to suggest one specific synergy that, that could be interesting, both Matt and Michael alluded to the power needed mm -hmm. to charge. Um, school buses are, are an are a interesting use case uh, that, that are moving forward rapidly. And if you imagine co-locating, uh, depending on the location, of course, in, in the LA area, co-locating a charging facility that could also be a repository for school buses because they sit idle for much of the time, right? And so they have also very large batteries, not quite as large. This could potentially mitigate some of the cost impact. Those batteries could actually serve as a power delivery device during peak charging times. Um, and so I would just, I guess this to, at a higher level for the architects and, and those of you thinking about this opportunity, there's three things that I think you could try to optimize against. Uh, one would be the, the utilities have to obviously be part of this conversation because of what Michael and Matt talked about, this, this incredible power demand, which could be, frankly, disqualifying from an economic standpoint if you don't do it well. Um, so looking at the school buses, which I don't, maybe someone on the, on the call knows how many school buses exist in the city of LA or even near the port, um, but I imagine it's quite, quite a few. So some creative synergy between school buses, working with the utilities and that convenience factor for the drivers of those three different use cases, the dray edge, the medium haul, and the long haul, might open up some really interesting economic advantages frankly, that could, could make this a reality. Because I agree with Michael, and I think Michelle, who's pointed out that this is an infrastructure question at the end of the day. Um, the technology for the vehicles, I think, is there. You've heard of enough uh, OEMs that, are make, that can make these vehicles, but it's all about economics. Hillary, Michael, thoughts on that before we move on? I think it's a great idea. I love I love that idea of the school bus. I mean, I, I do think, you know, just to look at, at the issue of its scale and um, location and accessibility would be fantastic. Um, a, a question, as I mentioned on, on the parks element of your proposal, of course, you're absolutely right that the environmental brunt of, of this kind of industry has been borne by communities along the 710 and other freeway corridors. Um, and there is a reparative um, and environmental justice um, aspect to how we address all of these questions that has to be at the center of these discussions. At the same time, um, some recent research seems to suggest that the air quality problems, of course, won't go away entirely when we switch to electric. There's also, um, uh, th there's, uh, elements of air pollution particulates that come from other elements of cars whether that's uh, tires or other things so i'm just this is a question for the whole group but also for you guys as you were thinking about where to locate parks what does it mean to locate parks we we obviously try to steer clear of doing locating parks next to freeways now for all kinds of uh, air quality issues and there's a pretty devastating study from usc in fact a decade or so ago about uh, impacts on lung development of children and um, not just housing, but also schools and parks near located within, I think, 500 feet of, of, of freeways. I'm curious how that changes or doesn't change as we move to uh, electric trucking, to electric uh, electrified transportation. So I want to open that up to all of you. Well, I'll just offer that there still is brake dust and tire dust. Um, and those are real next to a freeway. So the, those environmental issues will become, as our vehicles become zero emission in terms of tailpipe, those other problems will become more and more real because all that stuff um, you know, ultimately washes out into the ocean. But before then, it's probably uh, getting onto the fields and things like that. So as a problem, I'll throw that out there. I don't have a solution. Yeah, I'm not so sure that I see the general public mixing in maybe green space that might be adjacent or part of a truck stop for the, you know, for the drayage truckers. 
Um, you know, there are other green spaces, as I said, you know, along the, the waterfronts uh, for the general public. But, you know, it's, you know, you think back to the big battle over the reuse of Long Beach Naval Station, all of the park space and the ball fields and the pool and all of that. And, you know, the architectural historians that were brought in and did the planning analysis basically found that people did not want to drive down there to use those amenities. The military did, of course, when they were stationed, there was an active base. But after the Navy left, they didn't think that it would be viable to maintain those recreational facilities on Terminal Island because of low usage. There's a Cesar Chavez Park in downtown Long Beach, right as the 710 ends. And it's actually within the ramps of the freeway. You see the park there and whatever. And I drive by it all the time. Very little usage right in that area by those clover leaves. Michelle, Matt, thoughts about that? This question of air quality as we move to electric. Well, I'm certainly not an urban planner, so I will leave that to other folks to comment specifically on the placement of parks. I would just say that, you know, on the parallel, I, or excuse me, parallel 110 freeway, uh, parallel to the 710, you know, that's right along the LA River, and there is a whole push to create a seamless bike lane all along uh, that corridor. Um, and so I think. Um, there is some precedent for having these types of green spaces along our, our freeway corridors and um, obviously it has to be done in a, a smart manner. Uh, but I think that the more we can have those spaces, whether they're actively utilized as recreational spaces or just as green space, um, I think it is beneficial to have them in place. Sorry, I missed part of it. I was texting with the mayor telling him what a good, <laughs> good session this was. <laughs> Good um, to hear. Good to hear. Did you? Did you? Um, it was just about air quality and and the uh, brake dust, tire dust. The, the the idea that we won't completely solve the problem of of air quality and air yeah, pollution. Yeah, you know, I, I, that's absolutely true. Uh, uh, but we, I mean, that's next level of opportunity in you know twenty years to get to that that air pollution. Um, those are significant, and and the air quality standard st studies have found within 500 feet of a freeway that the brake dust in particular is, is a challenge. I will say that um, the other benefit of these trucks becoming electric is just the noise and vibration, mm. the road damage. I mean, yes, there'll be still heavy trucks, in some cases heavier, uh, but but the, the vibration and, and, and noise is just going to transform the city. Great. So in, in the few minutes that we have left, I want to give everybody a chance to offer some final thoughts, particularly as I did in the last session, focusing on what your advice to the city would be as we think about all of the challenges that we and opportunities that we've, we've talked about in this session. I think particularly things that have stood out to me are uh, this question of education. I really like this question of perspective and vantage point. Uh, we didn't get to touch on that, but Michael, Meredith, that you mentioned um, the sort of vantage that truck drivers have and, and turning that into a kind of design idea, I think is really strong. Um, but particularly the challenge of integrating the scale of trucking, which is so dramatic, um, out, dramatically out of scale with a residential or even a park space, um, and the communities that have, as we've all been talking about, borne the brunt of um, these industry, particularly air pollution for so long. Um, and how you think about that relationship, and we've touched on that a little bit, but I, I really, that seems at the center of um, uh, of how the city needs to be thinking about it. And then finally, to the points that we've heard about the infrastructure really being the drag here, what the city can do um, in, in ways that we haven't touched on yet to accelerate that transition. Um, so the infrastructure, the the grid, those other questions um, don't continue to be a drag on this transition uh, for the trucking fleet. So um, I'll, I'll leave the last word to the architects, but let me um, maybe go to you, Geraldine, for some final thoughts. I would just say that um, you know, whatever forecast we come up with with the amount of charging stations we need, double it. Because um, the worst thing that will happen would be if truckers are waiting to charge you know that with all the other congestion problems down there and i would say look to there's a lots of property that the ports that's down in the ports that aren't being used i think there's opportunities there 
And the terminal operators may have to, they probably won't like it, they may have to have some of their um, charging capability within their terminals. Terrific, Michael Samalan. Yeah, um, very apropos of this discussion, I was actually talking with um, the city's planning department this morning, the, the group that is focused on um, the Harbor and, um, and Wilmington area to talk about some very real problems that I have had looking at properties there that uh, Matt Peterson alluded to earlier, contamination at sites and things of this nature that um, is going to complicate our ability to deploy infrastructure there. Um, and <clears throat> this is unfortunately where we run into sort of competing interests. You know, you uh, if you're, you start to uh, upturn some soil, now you're triggering remediation, things of this nature, and, and having to do stuff like that. Now you've made uh, what was a good project and, and a viable project an impossible project economically because you now have to remove, you know, three cubic feet of, of soil or whatever it happens to be, do your LID, um, you know, uh, infrastructure, which is all very good stuff, very important, very needed. Um, but will, you know, hamper to some extent the ability to put in other infrastructure. So finding novel ways, probably having to work with, um, you know, our state and local uh, state regulators, local air quality and, and you know, um, soil people. Maybe that means working with the DTSC, um, other state entities who might be able to come in, uh, bring some relief for this and brownfields would be, um, I think, really helpful in being able to actually acquire usable land um, in that area. Yeah, and it's really, it reminds me of how, how much of a crossover there are in these issues with uh, some of the other open space planning we're doing. I'm working a lot on the Taylor Yard so-called G2 parcel on Los Angeles River, where of course old rail yard, there's significant remediation cost, and those are the primary concerns of the immediate community as, as uh, you would expect. Um, thank you for that, Michael. Let me read a comment from one of the respondents in our in our last session, Professor, Professor Walensky Namias, who says, I agree with Michelle about the more general value of having the park almost regardless of use, especially if it will also in increase tree canopy in that area, which will help with both air, pollu air pollution and increased temperatures, which I think is, is worth keeping um, in mind. So, um, Michael, Meredith, let me, um, uh, sorry, Hillary and uh, Michael, let me turn it back to you for a, a final thought again with our thanks for having made this provocation from, uh, from across the country. Thanks, Christopher. It's great to be here and hear all of the feedback. I think obviously it's a really challenging um, topic and scale. And um, I, you know, I do think it's worth pursuing and particularly at the level of, of the building too, even though it's a small scale, like we were talking about, this is usually treated more as an infrastructural problem, but to really look at, you know, the kind of interface um, and at the material level and, and to think about what materials will be used in making any kind of building, whether it's a gas station or, uh, or the truck. And how can we think about that through issues of sustainability and affordability at the same time? It's a real wonderful potential for this. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> I mean, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for all the comments and, and for the opportunity to work on this. I, I do think it's an opportunity for everybody. It's been said before, uh, with the other groups to to think big and long term. I mean, it is a problem. I know I can I can imagine from everybody the comments that we've gotten. Also, there is a you know everyone's like you need it, when people say it's a, a infrastructure problem, it means it's a public funding problem in a way, as I understand it. And you know you need private partnerships to make things happen. It seems like, but I. But cities are facing really big problems down the road in general. I, I think if you don't think big at the moment, you're really going to be in trouble in uh, our grandkids' lives or something. You know, like it's just it's it's changing very fast. And even the thing that Hillary said at the beginning when she talked about the the Post, uh, Washington Post uh, poll. Polling, I mean, I think the data is a little skewed, but the majority of Americans don't want to live in a big city, for sure. And so, and this is only, as we're seeing through COVID and, we're, and everything else going on in the world, it, there is a, there's a potential shift. I mean, we've been through it before. So what does it all mean? 
and how do cities adapt to it? And if we can't figure out how to, to bring, uh, I think parks especially, or some sense of environmental justice back into the cities, it's really, it really is going to be a reckoning. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a heavy note to end on, but an appropriate one. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Hillary. Um, thanks to all the respondents in this, in this session. Thanks to all the presenters, architects, the teams that made proposals earlier in the day and the earlier respondents. Uh, thanks to everyone in the audience who stuck with us. Um, and, and probably a, a special thanks to Michael and Hillary because it's probably well into the evening, right? New York City, New York time. Our kids um, are on iPads. <laughs> yeah, everybody's. Um, so we really appreciate that. We ap appreciate the expertise, thoughtfulness, wisdom that uh, everyone has brought to these discussions. Um, let me offer in closing final uh, special thanks as well to Audi, Electrify America, USC, Jorn Seif, Academy in the Public Square, uh, Lacey and our other partners um, in this effort. It has really clarified for me the steps forward and we're, we're lucky to have some additional sponsorship from uh, those partners I just mentioned to allow us to think about publication and really extending some of this work into 2021. We all know what the urgency looks like in all three of these categories. Um, and so it's really helped us understand and clarify what the next steps will will look like in really turning some of these ideas into policy and continuing to inform the conversations that we're having, whether that's planning uh, at the port, um, in the sustainability office, and, and elsewhere in City Hall. So uh, again, uh, warm thanks and gratitude uh, from us to all of you. Um, and we'll see you at the next third Los Angeles event in 2021. Happy holidays, everybody. Thanks again. <laughs>